Hello, everybody. I'm not I'm not re-recording the intro. Hello, everybody. James here, WSI. Uh, my next guest, the founder of ECW and the author of the new biography, Todd is God, co-authored by Sean Oliver, Todd Gordon. Hello. James, how are you? I am disappointed I made and didn't play any of the hits I wanted them to, apart from Come, Can I Play With Madness. That's about it. Horrible, wasn't it? I hate when they do that. What music are you into? Stuff. What, me- what music are you into? Because, like... ECW is famous for having some great themes going on. Like, how much of how much of brainstorming sessions were you involved in with the picking of music? Let's say I was absolutely not involved in anything because at that time I was strictly classic rock. So I was in hip towards going over the new stuff. But and Paul had his finger on all that kind of stuff. He was great with the music and he find, finding the right song for the right guy. And that's how I got into that music. I mean, from here comes the hot pepper to. Hot Stepper or whatever. Every one of those songs were on there. Became songs I loved after that. So I my takes vary all the way from, you know, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin through classic rock through modern stuff. I pretty collected no collected taste thing, like everything. Mm. Uh, Terry Funk's always I'm gonna bring up Terry Funk in a second actually, because he wrote the intro to your book. But Terry Funk, I thought what was it? Was it Emerson Lake and Palmer he had? No, he came out to Desperado. I'm sure he had um it's like fanfare for the common man or something like that at one point, or I entirely misremember. That was who? Dusty Rhodes. Was that Dusty Rhodes? Yeah, the common man. No, 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 no fanfare for the common man. Emerson, like, and part. Terrible song. Uh, I, just, I, I always think of Desperado, I think, Terry Funk. Okay, uh, spe- and speaking of Terry Funk, so brought it up. Uh, you have so many, you know, notes from ECW uh, wrestlers crediting you in the beginning of the book. And Terry Funk is the one who has chosen to write the introduction to it. Why Terry? And also, how is Terry uh, coping these days? Uh, he's having a rough time right now. I'm not going to lie. He's uh, going through very tough times. Uh, physically, uh, mentally, just not, you know, he's, he's getting older now. He's close to 80. And he's had a hard life. I mean, he's taken a lot of uh, abuse in the ring over the years. He's been doing it for how many years? He was doing moonsaults in his 60s in the ECW arena. I mean, I was so honored and touched that he agreed to do it. Because to me, he was always the epitome of everything we did. He was the one who elevated everyone who ever worked there. I mean, there would be no public enemy and no one ever, no one ever heard of public enemy. Shane Douglas, Sabu, he took each of them one by one or two by one and elevated them and made them made of their names just by working programs with him. He was generous. He was giving. He was kind. He still is. I'm saying, but back then, he was generous, giving, kind to everybody in the locker room, a true leader, and loved what we were doing. I mean, he genuinely loved the product. He loved our whole concept of what I had in mind from day one. He came in for our very first TV taping as a color commentator. He worked on color commentary. Eddie Gilbert brought him in, who had been working a program with him in Texas, actually. And uh, they started their angle. That was the first major angle we started with Eddie against Terry Funk. Do you know when, um, because obviously, you know, the first year or two, you're bringing in all these legendary names, uh, sort of ex-WWF names from, you know, King Kong Bundy, Tito Santana, my man Don Morocco. What was it about Terry Funk uh, that sort of made him stick around? Because I believe Heyman sort of said something to the effect of, this company needs one legend and then everyone else is a young guy sort of revolving around them or, or coexisting with them. So why was Terry Funk picked as that legend over so many others? Well, for one thing, Paul wasn't even booking then. So I don't know why he's saying that. We had a, it wasn't even a philosophy. I was a big fan, big mark for Terry Funk. Uh, the first big show we did, I decided what I wanted to do, even from day one, I wanted to watch, put on shows that I wanted to see. If I would enjoy seeing it, this is the match I want to see, then the people who are my kinds of fans will want to see the same thing. I mean, the very first big main event was Terry Funk, Abdul the Butcher, Stan Delary and Hansen, and Kevin Sullivan. Four guys that I grew up watching, you know, not grew up, but as you know, when I was watching it, they were the hardcore guys. They were the guys who actually knew how to keep the crowd at a frenetic pace, and they were how to bring them up, how to bring them down. They, they were just veterans, just pros of what they did. And we're so good at it. Um, Funk, when he first came in, we were streaming for TVs. Uh, we hit it off, as I said. I sat down with him. You know, at one point, I even asked him if he wanted to be my booker. 
his exact words to me as he put his arm around me. <laughs> you can't afford me. <laughs> let's just keep going. let's just keep doing what we're doing. We got a good thing going here. So you know, we laugh about it, but yeah, he was right. If I couldn't afford him as a booker, making him have to move from Amarillo, but uh, he was the guy, the glue. He was the glue. With uh, Terry also, I, I spoke to Stevie Richards, interviewed him quite recently, and I brought up one of the old matches that I've got stuck in my memory from actually watching on the network. And it's a match with Terry and Dory versus Stevie and whoever. And the finish comes from basically 10 minutes of headlocking Stevie until he collapses and falls over. And I thought that was a really great finish because it just goes to prove that any move can be a finisher if you know what you're doing. That's how smart Terry was. Like Cactus, like Snooker, there were certain guys who just, you know, it was innate. They didn't have to think about it. Well, on the spot, on the fly, they go, ah, oh, let's try this. No one else is doing this. It's hard to stand out and be different in the group like we had. But uh, yeah, before Terry came in, there was Jimmy and Morocco first. Snook and Morocco were really the first two names that were my mainstays. I was trying to re, you know, reinvent that feud from they had in the WWE. And that's really what I was trying to build around those two to start with. Ivan Koloff, because he was just a drive away. Then eventually we got Terry to come along until we started getting TV, which would be a year later. With uh, I'm actually going to come back to all the legendary names that you had in ECW Eastern Championship Wrestling version in a future question a couple of ways down. But before I do, uh, another bit of the book, Todd is God, and you've got quite a few wrestlers writing nice things about you, and this one is from Blue Meanie. If Todd hadn't sacrificed his own personal wealth to start a promotion, God knows how many careers might have been lost or might not have been discovered. I'm going to start with a fairly big question here. How much did you invest of your own money in Eastern Championship Wrestling to get it started, including, you know, paying NWA fees and licenses and that kind of thing. And how much do you think you invested in it over time? Getting it started was really not a big investment. Uh, the shows were not expensive to put on. We were only running bar shows. You know, other than the one name that we would bring in, say Ivan Qualf would come in, he'd be the only name talent on the show, making like maybe $300 a night. Uh, the other guys were all making a hundred and less when we first started. So there was not a big overhead. We even did bar shows where the bar would keep the uh, bar money and we get all the ticket money. So we didn't have to pay them for the building or rent. Uh, because I had no intention of starting a federation, people like Bob Ortiz and Stevie Truitt and Larry Winters were the three that approached me to first do this. They were all working for free. So that's free ring announcer, free sound, free wrestler. So there, there was so many parties that really wasn't investing much of anything at all. You had a free ring as well, didn't you? Well, yeah. You had to, if you used the right guy's ring, uh, Max Thrasher was the guy who would give you his ring as long as he worked on the show. That's how he got his booking back then. And he had a small 16-foot ring, but again, you got to go by the price, too. The price was right. It was free. Uh, as we started to grow and expand, <laughs> yeah, a lot more cash flow went into the company. Uh, Better from like, ah, it's already costing me a thing. Like, oh my God, what is this costing me? Uh, you know, there was a couple hundred thousand dollars in a while, certainly. Mm. Did, when, when did it, do you remember like maybe the exact like event where you started looking at the bank balance and thinking, oh dear, this is going to start costing me more from this part, you know, this day onwards sort of thing? Well, I think that once we got into the ECW arena, obviously, and we're, and we're running TV every week and paying for the, that. TV show to be not we were paying for it to be on, but paying for it to be produced by the guy who's filming it and putting it all together. Um, I saw the expenses going up, but I also thought to myself, hey, we're building something here. Is each week and each month the, the numbers were better. The tape being sold were, you know, getting crazy all of a sudden. So I knew there was something there that would eventually be a free or turn on the investment. So I wasn't afraid of like, you know, the investment as it stood in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, even a year and a half, two years in, I was thinking, I'll get this back. I know we got something here. I just feel it. We'll get it back. Uh, financially speaking. We kept expanding more, unfortunately, before we get it back. Next thing you know, when we got to the pay per stage, it was never going to be able to come back. There's always going to have more outfits coming in. I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to be bringing up the pay per view in a while as well. Uh, I want to take it back slightly to Joel Goodhart's TWA. That's sort of the pre ECW that I think uh, is, is best remembered for. Uh, financially speaking and booking wise as well, what did you learn from Joel as far as what to do and what not to do? Well, the obvious what not to do 
was the point of the show with so much expensive talent that you had no chance at all of recouping your investment because you're only running once a month or once every couple of months, I think it was, in that big show. And when he would lose that one big show, well, it made him stand out and be different than any other promoter because he was bringing talent and nobody else could get or bring in. Nobody else would either because of the expense of it. Um, be it the Freebirds, be it, um, you know, Eddie Gilbert, Cactus Jack, whoever he was bringing in at the time, he'd load the card with like 20 people like that. He'd have Waller and Idol and Austin Idol and just anybody who was not tied down, he would bring in. I said, I don't understand the, mo- the model here. You're going to lose your ass every couple of months. Well, specifically Austin Idol as well. It's like, uh, he, does he have any history in Philadelphia? None. But see him in a magazine, it's all talk. Joel saw him in a magazine, he thought about it. Uh, so he, he didn't seem to care. He just didn't, wasn't looking at it, building up something. He wasn't thinking where it could go. He was living in the moment, pretty much. Mm-hmm. But he didn't do the booking, really. He gave that to the wrestlers. He booked his own school kids. The J.T. Smith, Larry Winters, Hot Body, Stetson, Sam Land. I mean, that was his school. Ringmaster school. And he booked them. And all the other guys, he just said, whatever you guys want. You do whatever you need to do. Work out your own finish. Who's going over? I'm not going to get, you know. So that, that's, about- that's who makes running the asylum there straight off the bat, isn't it? Well, yes and no, because again, wanting to show four times a year, four major shows like yeah. that. You don't need it. There's no angles that will be done. There's, not, there's no one to see. There's no one to follow up. You're going to say, oh my God, look what he did. I can't wait to come back in four months and see what happens. So it wasn't really a major issue. He didn't care if it was a Broadway or count out or you know, whatever the case may be. But again, it's, it's hard to get anything going momentum wise. When you're bringing all, all those people in, they're not seeing you every other four months. In between, all you're doing is bar shows. Uh, we're going to go back to Eastern Championship Wrestling. And for those who don't know, there was quite a special amount of talent that was actually in Eastern Championship Wrestling for you know, one or two shots or here and there in the first couple of years. I've got a list of a few of them. Uh, Magnificent Morocco, you know, my former podcast partner, Tito Santana, Jimmy Snooker, King Kong Bundy, Road Warrior Hawk, the Steiner Brothers, David Boy Smith, Jim Neidhart, Stan Hansen, Ivan Koloff, Kerry Von Erich, which I didn't know until I read the book. That name completely passed me by as well. Um, a couple of different questions. Who was your favorite to book of all the old school WWF guys? Maybe just as, you know, being a fan and just loving to be around them or just being great people. And also, what did they charge on average? Okay, let me start with a couple of things. Number one, Bundy didn't come in until we were, I think, we were already extreme at that point, or at least in, in the bigger buildings. He was in for a one shot. Tito only worked one or two shots. Uh, the other guys in the England mostly worked regularly. Kerry was not with Eastern. Kerry came in for a convention that Dennis Carluzzo was running. Uh, Dennis Carluzzo was a promoter from New Jersey. Uh, he, we had an agreement that he would not come across the bridge and vice versa, meaning he wouldn't run shows in Philly, I wouldn't run shows in Jersey. And he had an opportunity to do a show at an uh, airport, the Philadelphia Airport Hotel. They have a big convention. He contacted me and said, listen, you know, I, I have a chance to do this, and what I do out of respect, how about I bring you in and cut you in on the deal? You don't have to lay out anything, you're just going to percentage of, you know, of the profit. And if you want, you can put you know one of your guys on in a match. It's one of my guys, whatever you want to do. It ended up being Sam in, by the way. He was following me for the last 30 something years. It's always been Sam and I, but it was, ended up being Sam in. And at that show, during the daytime, there was a convention. And in the middle of the convention, Kevin Sullivan flew out the door. Where'd Kevin go? He said something about the cops. He had to get out of town. You know, I don't know. I don't think even met Kevin at that point yet. So that night, we were supposed to do a match uh, with Kevin, with a woman coming into the ring. I don't even remember who he was working against. Well, now, Kevin there, they need to put somebody in. So how about Kerry? All right, we get Kerry to do it. I said, Kerry, that's making a surprise, though. I mean, they're going to be disappointed that Kevin's not there. So in order to bring you know bring them back for the fact they're pissed off that no one said he wasn't going to be there, you'll be a big enough name that would supplant that. Go out of the hood. When you get in the ring, Nancy, you know, woman will pull the hood off you and really you are. You got it, boss. About 10 minutes later, he goes, why am I wearing a hood again? I said, well, because no one knows you're going to be here. You're surprised. Ah, uh-uh, got, got it, got it. Off we went. They were just about ready, about 10 minutes before the match starts. I go, make sure everybody's got their stuff. I walk in, they're all ready to go. 
Yes, sir. I handed the hood. He goes, what's that for? What? Er. <laughs> what? He says, what's the hood for? I said, well, you're a surprise. Remember? You're going to go after with Nancy. She's going to pull the hood off you and reveal you. And every odds oh, carry that every week, you know, pop for you. You got it, boss. So I'm standing there watching in the back. He's about ready to come out. And he walks through the curtain. And from behind, all I see is a man with the hood on and a giant jacket with the tassel that says carry on it. <laughs> I said, is that, is that a rib? I mean, is that, that really just happened? Is that possible? And sure enough, it was. Sadly, he died a few days later. It only lasted like two or three days after that. But that, that was my carry on Eric moment. He walked out there with the carry on it. Did, was that his last match as well, do you think? Or? Yeah, it was. Wow. I, I, I mean, it's sort of a weird like claim to fame to be able to say I booked Kerry's last match as well, I suppose. Well, I really didn't book, I mean, really, they had to put the whole show together. I just found a substitute to help out when it's only for Kevin. With um, with all the old guard that I mentioned... Uh, Jimmy Suck, to answer your question. Yes, Jimmy Suck is your favourite. He was the guy, who, my first real relationship, I should say, with a WWE store. I mean, I'd had Ivan call off him before that, and, you know, got along fine. But Jimmy and I could develop a friendship. And I uh, ended up putting my first belt on him, actually. <clears throat> and we just, you know, he started coming in for all the shows. And his wife was working in the travel travel industry. That's the Morocco's. Mm-hmm. So there was never an airline ticket involved. And not having to fly them in from Utah and Don's case, Hawaii, was safe. You know, you don't mind paying a little extra salary to fly them in. Those was, was flights were expensive back then. Still are, but, you know, Utah and uh, Hawaii, like I said. So Jimmy came in from Utah and he'd stay sometimes for two, three weeks at a time, hang out with whoever. And uh, we actually became buds. Uh, he could smoke like nobody's. I mean, like nobody you ever saw. At the time, I think he must have been, I guess he would have been this around 50. I'm telling you, there was not one inch not one inch of fat anywhere on this man's body. He was just like a rock. I'm sure he put a lot of hours in the gym, obviously, but for, I mean, his muscles had muscles. He was so physically fit. Do you know what Don told me? He just went, Jimmy Snooker almost never went to the gym. He just that went, right? that's what Don told me. And I was like, how could that possibly be? And he said, he was just naturally just a freak. Or maybe unnaturally to a point, but naturally a freak as well. Well, he was chiseled. I will tell you that. My God, we'd sit there and go, you know, roll up with and I'd look at his arms, and every like vein would become. It was crazy how how defined he was. And it was funny, but people didn't realize it because he was very shy around other people. He didn't like show them his real personality. We'd sit there very quietly in the locker room for hours and hardly talk to anybody except, "Hey, brother," "Hey, sister," and that kind of thing. We became good friends, actually. I like how uh, you also say in the book as well. Uh, I'm I'm just constantly trying to prove to you that I've read the book, but you say uh, that it sort of goes to some way explaining uh, some of Jimmy Snooker's more interesting promo style because he never saw a joint that he didn't smoke kind of thing. Well, that only really happened one time. I don't know what he was taking, whether he was, whether it was just smoke or what. But he went into the back, you know, he was 60 seconds. This is now when we're on TV. This is now we're extreme ready. This is no problem. He goes, you know, brother, as the lava flows and the super fly climbs the cliff, it looks out into the sunset, into the rising sun. Ah! It went on for another 15 minutes. And everybody in the room was like, what the fuck just happened? And the cameraman scared to death. He's like he's almost shaking the camera because he, he's not going to stop him. You know, no one's going to say a word to the guy. He's a legend, for God's sakes. And he went on for like 15 minutes for a 60 second spot that we never ran. <laughs> and what, what time of night did he have to do the promo as well? Was it a 4 a.m. kind no, of thing? Not late at all. It wasn't like that kind of thing. It, was probably, it could have even been pre show. It's just one of those weird things where he went off and just couldn't bring himself back. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, oh, fact, Jimmy was a natural. When I first met Jimmy, he came with his, with his wife, who was supposed to be his manager. 
and she wanted to check things out, which in reality meant she wanted to get a free plane ticket or whatever. She wanted to come in and see the Philly. So I brought her in and went to an expensive um, seafood restaurant. They were supposed to meet me there right from the plane. And I'm there as I always am. My business attire, my suit and tie. It's a very, very nice restaurant, mind you. <laughs> in comes Jimmy, and he's wearing his garb. I mean, he's got the flowing rope things on, and he's got sandals on. And everybody, there's no mistake who he was. People were like, oh my God, it's him. Like, he, he wore that all the time. That wasn't something he just wore to the ring. That's the way he dressed. <laughs> I remember going to a wedding. In fact, Steve Truitt was uh, Stevie Wonderful. His wedding, uh, he invited us to the wedding. Jimmy and I went and I picked him up again. To the tie. He comes out. And he's wearing the long flowing robe. And he's got this, this, this uh, sandals on. And Jimmy, it's a wedding. He goes, I'm wearing my good sandals. <laughs> so yeah, that was Jimmy. Jimmy was great. Why didn't Why didn't you keep Jimmy around longer? Was it was it a money thing? Or was it like a stylistic thing? Or around for years. See, I associate him with like night two, night three, maybe a bit of night four, and then he just more or less seems to disappear after that. Is that not? Am I misremembering? I don't remember. The, I can't the dates. I'm terrible with it. I'm tell you right up front, I do not do well remembering dates. I can remember incidents, but dates now. But one day, uh, like I said, at this point, end of the Paul and I regime. He said, I have someone, I'd have lunch with you guys, to meet you guys. I have a lawyer I want to bring in. It was me, you guys. I'm going to lawyer. And we had a philosophy, we had a rule, basically. We don't deal with agents or wives. Mm -hmm. We don't talk to your wife. She doesn't like what you're doing. Then don't do it. Don't make us be the bad guy to your wife. And we don't talk to agents because I don't want to give somebody a piece of your action. That's crazy. If you want to do it, that's up to you. I don't want anything to do with that. So he comes in, I remember the guy's name, Gordon Govins, G-O-V-I-N-S. And uh, he came in and said, I'm representing Jimmy now. And we said, well, we don't deal with agents, lawyers, wives, et cetera, et cetera. He said, well, you're going to deal with me. Said, okay. Um, he starts talking about what he thinks Jimmy should be making, how, what percentages of the, this is you get. And I don't think we still haven't made a dime yet. We're still losing money. This guy's talking about getting up a percentage of the profit. It's like he's in Hollywood or something. And then Paul said, Listen, I understand what you're saying. My dad's a lawyer. And the guy turned around and went, Good for you. Well, Paul well, pushed the day away. Like that was the end of that meeting. And probably Jimmy didn't last much longer after that. And he felt bad about it. We stayed friends. But he didn't work. He worked for like I said, a couple of years straight. We will. Uh... That's really we will move on. We will move on, and uh, I want to ask about Eddie Gilbert. As, as I was talking to you beforehand with Dutch Mantel. Uh, he's got loads of Eddie Gilbert stories, and the way he puts, and I think it's a great way to put it, is that Eddie had two addictions: drugs and wrestling. And he thinks that wrestling might have been the more all-consuming of the two addictions with Eddie. Is that probably fair to say? Yeah, I throw in girls as a third addiction, but yeah, <laughs> the healthiest of the three by far. Yes. That's the first time I ever met Sunny Tammy, whatever she wanted to be called at the time. She was coming out of his, uh, the place that I'd set him up here in Philadelphia to live in, or the uh, suites places, the furniture already furnished, et cetera, Corman Suites. I was like, who's that? Was, uh, her name's Tammy. She's, she wants to get in the business, blah, 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 blah. I don't, I don't need to know any more than that. <laughs> Eddie, was, Eddie was unique. Eddie had so much ability and so much talent. He was so smart, but he was so paranoid because he grew up in a, a part of the industry. You know, grew up during the years. Well, besides just everything being kayfabe, people were just so dishonest. Promoters were so dishonest. So he was always on guard. And I tell the story about him picking up, a, I believe, it was a torch newsletter. Or an observer, I'm not sure. He's reading and he goes, Do you see that? I took it there. So, what, what? Read that. So it says, Eddie Gilbert was an ECW Saturday night. Instead of, rather, he didn't work the show in Memphis, Tennessee, or whatever, Alabama, or wherever it was. I said, Yeah, you did. You did work our show, not that one. He goes, Don't you know what they're saying? I said, I'm not saying anything. 
you've got to read between the lines. They're saying, I fucked that promoter there. And I did. I said, where are you reading? Where, you know, where, where are you reading that? I don't see anything. I see one sentence. He turned that into a complete. And I went, wow. And this guy was paranoid. Paul was the same way, by the way, but he was very paranoid. But the irony of that I, is, is that Eddie Gilbert was the one who got ECW started getting mentions in the dirt sheets in the first place, wasn't he? Hundred percent. He said, kept saying, "What do you, what do you want more? What do you want now? What else can we do?" I said, "Well, number one, I see these sheets come out. They mentioned Smoky Mountain and what's going on there, and WWE." They said, "When do we get to that level? When do we, you know, we're on TV now. When do we get to a level where, you know, we're also considered another?" Per- Promotion that people should be looking at. He goes, Oh, you want to be in the sheets? I said, Well, yeah. Two weeks later, there we were. That was that. I mean, he had a relationship. He had relationships with those guys, obviously. He was going to make a phone call. And next thing you know, they had our ratings in there every week, they had our storylines, on and on and on. And we never looked back. With- we had really a springboard to getting more uh, popularity outside of the Philadelphia area. <clears throat> with with Eddie, um, I, th- I think generally people can sort of focus on some of the negatives, and uh, I know he passed away early and everything, but what made him such a great booker? Well, a lot of what he did, to be honest with you, was recreating things he'd done in Memphis, or Jerry Lawler had done in Memphis, from wearing the crown, being the king of Philadelphia, king of Memphis. Um, a lot of the angles and the, the craziness, it was, he wanted to be Jerry Lawler. They couldn't do it down there. They tried to recreate it up here, but up here, no one had gotten Memphis TV. No one had seen any of these angles. All they had done, maybe picked up a Pro Wrestling Illustrated magazine and seen a couple pictures of uh, Eddie running over Jerry all over the car, but no one had ever seen all the other stuff or any, anything. So while to us it was creative and fresh, I don't know how much of it was original and how much wasn't. You know, I know a lot of it was, and I know a lot of it wasn't. But he would do his own thing. <laughs> we would go out and make Eddie, myself, and the cameraman. And they would have on the, the red jacket, the glitter all over it, and, and the crown, and a t-shirt that said King Eddie Gilbert. And we walked through a dance club with thousands of people we were in the dark with a big light on him with a camera. And he'd walk through, oh, it's okay, autographs, like, I'll get you later on. And people would go, who is this guy? Get out of here. Remember dancing here? No one knew who he was. You know, things were not a wrestling crowd, but he would act like he was the most popular guy in the room. And he was just funny like that. He'd keep a straight face and keep going and going. There was a cheesesteak place on South Street here, which is like a young person's hangout street, basically. And this place called Jim's King of Steaks. He walks up to order and he gets in this argument with a guy who's a thick accented guy. He's like, I'm the king. I'm the king of Philadelphia. The guy goes, You want cheesesteak? He's like, he's king. I'm the guy that got this argument. We're filming the whole, and it was on TV. But he, he was just spur of the moment funny. He had aspirations to be a politician. Oh, really? Yeah, very much so. He was really into politics. And I took him to a few uh, variety club functions. There were political fundraisers. And I, he, he sucked it up. I mean, he, he loved it. He really, that's what he really wanted to do when he got back to Memphis. Or get back to Tennessee, I should say. It's a wrestler in politics, eh? Who would have thought it? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I've already sort of primed you that I was going to ask this beforehand. And you know that Shane Douglas was on my channel, or was sort of a semi-regular on uh, my channel, and he gave a version of why Eddie Gilbert left the booking, not even there was a committee, why he left as ECW booker. And you've seen that, and you say that's not true, and what is the real story? What happened was... And he was missing work. He was not showing up at the studio to get the TV show done, which is what I was paying him for. I was paying for his place to live, paying him a salary. And, you know, that was his own job. And you gave him a raise uh, shortly beforehand as well? Um, yeah, there was another issue about the Crockett issue. Yeah, he took it took at one point. He jumped me in the timeline, but I guess what happened at that point was Paul was getting ready to go start a promotion with Jim Crockett. World Wrestling Network, WWN. And um, he was only in to help Eddie out for a little bit before he was going to leave. And um, he said to me one day, he goes, listen, Crockett offered me 
200 hours or 500 hours more week to come be his booker and work with him. He said, yeah. He said, well, he said, well, what? <laughs> he goes, I do you 500 hours. Like, you know, I got to take it. I said, you got to be kidding me. I thought we're like buds. We're some, you know, friends here. He said, we are, right? I can't turn that down. I said, well, you know, I can't afford 500 more a week because you know what the budget is. You know, we're paying everybody. You're right there. The meeting's done. What's being laid out and what's coming in. There's secrets between us. I said, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll do 150 more. I think it went from 1350 to 1500. That's it. You know, I'm done. All right. I, you know, I'll stay. He never had an offer on the table, but today I was still green. You know, two years later, I would not have made that mistake. I would have said, have a nice, have a nice day. That's the case. But uh, you get like an extra 150, and then I ended up not showing up for work. <laughs> Give me help. I'm sick today. And this and that. I'm hungover. Whatever it may be. So finally, you know, it was a weekend that we had to show in to the station by, I want to say, like that night, I mean, six o'clock, and it should have been there the day before. And I'm, I go roll up to the studio, and Eddie, you know, I left work, and went, what's going on? What do you mean, what's going on? And the shirt's got to be there like yesterday. And I got to run, run to the studio now. I said, you know, is it done? What's going on? You, 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 know, what do you think I'm not working? I, what do you want to be? You're going to be Crockett. Crockett, what are you talking about? He was so paranoid that he built up in his own mind a scenario where Jim Crockett and I were working together with Paul against him. I said, Eddie, I've talked, told you every single contact I've ever had. Not that I had to, but I did. This is the way I am. I'm an honest guy. I told you every contact I ever had with Crockett, I told you every word that was ever spoken. There was nothing about you involved. And there's really nothing about me partnering up with him. He goes, well, that's it. That's it. You and that Jew Crockett, you both, you're, I'm done. I quit. I go, that's, it's more aim, that's closer to being Amish than it is to being Jewish. <laughs> Jim Crockett, are you kidding me? What? And he goes, come on, Doug. We're taking our ball and going home. And he got in the car, took Doug with him, went home. And I quit. That was the end of Eddie Gilbert, by the way. There was no Shane Douglas. There was no booking meeting. We didn't have booking meetings back then. So where that came from, I swear I have no idea. And the story, he had said something about my wife, and he did this, and then I came in and got it. I don't know where these wrestling fantasies start and where they end, but that was ridiculous. None of it was true. It's funny, we got comments like that as well, saying, oh, well, the real reason is, you know, by nameless, faceless people. It's like, well, where did you yeah. hear that? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the person I ever said that way back in the beginning was Paul. He said, I heard Eddie said, and I said, no, he, what? No, he didn't. Where'd you get that from? He said, I don't know, that's what I heard. That's, I guess that was the birth of it. But there was no booking meeting. Shane was never at a booking meeting. He certainly wasn't at that one. And then Eddie left, and then I had a show coming up six days later. Our first big main event, Eddie uh, Funk. Um, Abby and Stan Hansen. Now Eddie's out. I won 25% of my main event's not going to be there. After I promoted this on television for like two straight months, like eight straight weeks of TV. That's just what I needed. My first big show to be a guy, a promoter brings out somebody who's not there. Or not, you know, somebody's no shows and changes the whole card around, which you always hated as a fan. It happens sometimes because the promoter can't help it. But you don't have to like swerve anybody either. I don't want to swerve anybody. So, so I got to get good replacements. So it's good if not better. The so picture of the phone called Kevin Sullivan. Goes to, you got it, brother. Nancy, we're going to Philadelphia. So, you know, here's Kevin all ready to go. <laughs> like three days after that, Eddie calls me up. He goes, hey, boss, I'm sorry. I don't know what's the matter with me. I fucked up. Uh, I wasn't thinking straight. And I'll be there. Don't worry. I'll be there Saturday night. I said, hey, I don't know how to tell you this, bud. I replaced you. Said, what do you mean you replaced me? <laughs> I'm going to quit six days before the show. It's now two, three days before the show. I had to do something. And you're on the phone, mind you. Said, Who'd you replace me with? And I'll preface by saying that he hated Kevin Sullivan. Loathed Kevin Sullivan. Anytime in the past we brought his name up for coming in, 
and say, no, I don't want that fucker. No, no Kevin Sullivan. And that's why I ended up bringing it in. So I said, replace with Kevin Sullivan. You could have heard a pin drop on the other end of that phone. It was dead silence. Oh, well, would it be okay if I just came to the arena Saturday night off the field with my T-shirts and stuff and just thanked everybody and told me to keep support DCW? But yeah, I mean, you're my friend. I still consider your friend. You may quit. But yeah, of course you can. And that was towards the end of Eddie Gilbert pretty much for the most part. That night did come in, which caused a ruckus and a half in the back between Paul and Doug Gilbert. And there was a mess back there. And I guess sometime after that, about six months to a year, sometime in the next six months to a year, he was being brought in by Dennis Caruso for the NWA tournament or some kind, to the crown NWA champion. And um, he called me up and said, hey, if you want, I'll throw the belt down like Shane did. We'll turn into a whole big thing and like blah, 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 blah. I said, you know, I appreciate that. It's a cool idea and all. But to me, I said, that's going to bring us back. Going back down to that level, we've already like passed that level now. I don't have to, we're, we're shooting it, you know, the ass of like Hulk Hogan and uh, WWF and WCW. I mean, they're shooting on Dennis Caruso now. It's like really counterproductive. It's going the wrong direction, but thanks. Mm-hmm. I'll do it. We, I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad you spoke so much about Eddie as well because I think there's so much more to explore with Eddie. Eddie Gilbert and his career, you know, uh, I know you were with him in Puerto Rico and stuff like that, and especially like his brief booking stint in WCW and uh, or the NWA. So I always love to hear more about Eddie. Um, I'm actually going to skip a load of questions here, and I'm going to go straight to our first game. So name association. I'm going to give you a sentence. Uh, don't look too scared. I, I can see you on. <laughs> don't look too scared. It's nothing too bad. I don't think coming up. I'm going to give you a sentence. And you tell me the first name that comes to mind when you hear that sentence. And hey, there might even be a little story to sort of accompany it. We'll never know. Uh, well, we will know. We'll hear in a second. Uh, first one is funniest person in the locker room. Funniest person in the locker room? It's either Sabu, which I don't know if shock yet. Yes. Or Sam. Next one is last. Oh, this is going to be an easy one. Last man standing at the bar. <laughs> There's no question. They'll be there when it closes and when it opens. They'll still be there. Damn it. <laughs> hey. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> the biggest river. We didn't have rivers. That was one of the things that was really kind of different and cool about us. We had no rivers in our locker room. If we did. They never ribbed other people. For some reason, we just had a different atmosphere there. It wasn't like the big, you know, corporate where everyone's trying to screw each other to get a spot. It was the exact opposite of that. It was everybody like trying to help each other get better and elevate their particular match. They go on the next match, help that person. It was it really was like a team effort at that point. It was cr- and no one ever ribbed anyone. The only rib that ever happened actually was done by Paul and I. It was done in Rock and Rebel. Rock and Rebel was walking around bitching and moaning. I'm the only Eastern guy that hasn't gotten a belt since, you know, in Eastern history. I'm the only one of all the original guys that ever got a belt. JT got one, Sam Man. I'm the only one. So that night we were in Wildwood. <coughs> and I never had a title shot. I said, okay, I'll tell you what. A battle Royal, when you get to fight Snooker for the title. You win the Battle Royal, you're on the match against Snooker at night. I figured it was a nice peace offering. I'm going to win the belt, but at least it's going to be a main event. It's Wildwood, like a giant, you know, mainstay of ours. And within like 10 minutes, I see him over whispering to his girlfriend in the, in the bleachers. Then he runs over to Francine, who was a student in our school, and he's telling her, I'm going over it. And he's telling everybody. I said, what is this? This guy's first day in the business. What's the matter with him? The worst thing he could do. So once he did that, we told the whole battle royal, all the other 19 guys in it, Rebel goes out first. Now, that, that was bullshit. You had to be taught a lesson. And sure enough, battle royal started, ding, and everybody's running at Rebel. He's going, whoa, what are you doing? And they're all throwing. He goes, hey, I'm going over. I'm going over. They go, yeah, you are. <laughs> we're right now. They go right out of the ring. <laughs> He's not supposed to win. I said, what? He was the first one out. 
He was soaked his way back to the dresser. Then he got it though. He came over me afterwards. Look, I deserved it. I fucked up. You're right. Uh, I mean, it couldn't have really happened to a bigger piece of shit as well to be total ass. Agreed. Agreed. You should have tag team partner with Chris Benoit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jesus. Uh, the most beautiful woman of ECW in real life. Nancy Sullivan. So it, that was that easy as well. I mean, she was stunning, absolutely. And she was, and she was sweet and kind, but could hold her own. I mean, she if she needed to, she'll pull. She could pull that knife out of her boot she kept in there, but she never needed to. But she was a doll. She was caring. She was like a little sister and a, and a mom to almost everybody in there. Combination of both. It was a really unique personality trait. Uh, anyone we you Florida one time, We were in Florida one time, I remember, uh, running a couple shows down there, and Kevin said, come back, you'll stay with me at the condo. Nancy, fix the bed up for Todd at the condo. So I went back to stay with and I mean, so outside of her evening and home life, she was just a doll. I always like your uh, I like your impression of Kevin Sullivan. He's sort of like slightly Transylvanian Viscount as well. <laughs> it's that heavy Boston, you know, Nancy. Come on, Nancy. We're going to go, that kind of thing. You don't growl to it. There you go. You're set. Uh, is there anybody who you were desperate to bring into ECW that was available, but for whatever reason just didn't work out? No. Uh, Roddy Piper. Really? Yeah, I called Roddy Piper up before I had any Gilbert and before I had any Bookers when I was doing Morocco and Snooker as, you know, on all the different rounds, the loop we're running. And I said, would you be interested in coming in? Because, like, Psh. you think, you know, you think of Snooker, after the Snooker Morocco, you think of Snooker Piper. And those were his two big things. And I remember him saying to me, you know, pal, he goes, you got two really good boys there in Morocco and Snooker. They got really good boys. You don't need me. And I'm a flight from Portland, and I don't fly myself in. That flight by itself is a couple thousand dollars, and it was back then. Ugh. It's plus what I would want. You know, I can I can make that back on a show. But yeah, I can't. I'm drawing a couple hundred people at max back then. You know, Morocco and Snooker were coming in for free. You no know, flight instead of what's a couple thousand dollar flight plus. So I stacked him, and he said, believe me, you'll do fine with those two. And we did. So he's the only one that I wanted that I didn't get. I take it he was after business class, not he wasn't flying coach. I didn't even get that far. <laughs> didn't stop me um, I, don't, I don't know if you can answer this, really, because it's more of a locker room question. I'm sure you can, though. Uh, the biggest bully? There wasn't any bullies. There was... Pseudo bullies with Taz and Perry Saturn for a while, but they would only bully the people that were coming up, kind of thing, the students, kind of thing. They were going to go over and bully, uh, you know, Brian Lee. <laughs> you know, if you put them on top of each other, they would be looking eye to eye with Brian Lee. Uh, they weren't going to bully Sam, and they weren't going to bully Van Dam. But Sabu and Taz had so many issues back there, but he wasn't bullying him. But there were issues that Sabu, you know, really was getting pissed and Tyler was, wasn't letting up until Van Dam actually stepped in and stood up for Sabu one day. But uh, there were no bullies in the locker room. I'm telling you, we really had a very familial kind of locker room for the first two years. Up until like 95, we were a family. Hmm. And then it all started splintering. Uh, this next one, anyone ECW, ECW uh, revolving around there always says the same name, Smelliest Wrestler. Osborne. That's the right name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, funniest sign you ever saw in the crowd. Draw a blank. Um, I'll move on. Say again? I'll move on if you want me to. Yeah, I, I can't come up with it off the top of my head. I just remember the sign guy there who, for some reason, is the only person in the world who knew what we were doing before anybody else in the world did. I have no idea how. I mean, we brought Rick Root in under cover of like cloak of night, you know what I'm saying? When he came to the building in a mask. I mean, no one knew anything in the locker room. In the, in the locker room, who is that guy on the balcony up there? You no, know, we walk out there and there's a sign guy. Don't fuck up. It's rude. I don't. I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know how that guy did that. 
but he was the one who started Todd is God. Oh, really? He's the guy who held that sign up that said Todd is God. That every time it would come out, that's what the fans would chant. And that's how they got to the title of the book. There's that full circle. Uh, name was Paul I'm sorry, say it again. His name was Paul Mellis. We call him Sign Guy. Until Sign Guy Dudley was invented just to piss him off. And then um, he stopped bringing the signs after that, didn't he? He stopped bringing the signs after the King Dewey. Yes. That was... That is a promo as his focal point to turn heel. Which is to say, I'm not going to cane anybody. He talked about my kid. Now I'm not... You think that's hardcore? You're not hardcore. And he turned, and this kid was so upset. This young man, I should say. was so upset that he felt that he had something to do with Pax's career or change that he never brought a sign again. In fact, he stopped coming pretty early after that. Oh, right. So he never turned back up after after that? No. He may have come for another show or two. I'm not sure. But he was, he was looking at the tape. He was always in the front row for the first year and a half, two years, but then all of a sudden he was gone. There you go. Did, have you ever seen him since at like conventions or anything? Or Never. When you watch those old tape, it's so funny to look at the front row and some of the people sitting there who are all now part of the business. Either working like Blue Meanie, who's a fan in the third right or whatever. Uh, Mike Johnson is a scribe now for Pro Wrestling Insider. I mean, there's so many people who are regulars that eventually got in the business from ECW. It was the hat guy, the friend of the hat guy, the Faith No More guy, that like really angry hippie. Uh, I can't... Dread. <laughs> Dreads. Dreads. Uh, that guy. Uh, came to school. <laughs> Paid money to get trained. So we're giving his first spot. He's sitting in front row as always. We're bringing out of the crowd. You know, you just give shit the dime on one. You take the choke slam, leg out, and that'll be your first bump. Gets it. Al pulls him in the ring, picks him up. Boom! The choke slam. Kicking it down and sits back up again and starts laying to go back to his seat. <laughs> Nine one goes, What the fuck are you doing? He goes, What is? What are you doing? You stay the fuck down. He picks him up again. Boom. And he sits there for like 10 seconds. And he starts to roll again. Like he's so high. He starts to roll out of the ring. Paul goes, dude, you don't sit down this time. We're going to fucking knock you out unconscious. So he But a third time. Bam. Finally, the kid sold it. And a month goes by. And I get to call my office. And he was really whew, strung out on something. I have no idea what. He said, yo, uh, any money? I go, okay. What do you want from me? He goes, oh, it's going to be like half my deposit back from school. I don't know, I'm going to stop going to school. I said, you've been going to school for like four months. I didn't need your money back from the school. Said, I'm telling you, give my money back or I'm going to come down here and beat your ass. I said, what would you say? I'm in my office. He's like, I'll come down here. I said, okay. And it happens at the time, Anthony and Gary, who I believe were training him, actually, were in my office. Hanging out. That was your buddy Dreads. Tells me, once I'm down, kick my ass. And don't give him my, what? And Anthony was like, you know, very loyal guy. Dick Pimpos. That's what he said. He said, yeah, why? He's not. Never heard from the guy again. Never saw him again. I mean, I don't think he killed him or anything, but I'm just saying that guy never showed up or called or came to another show again. I was going to say, it sort of sounded like he killed him, the way you saw him. Yeah, well, I, I don't mean to sound that way, I mean, but I did never hear from him or see him again. I do know that Anthony went to have a conversation with him. Mm. It sounds like it's probably a one-way conversation as well, but we'll, yeah, pretty much. we'll, we'll move on that one. Um, I, see, I already, I already know the answer to this one, so we'll do it very quickly. The best travel companions for you. Yeah, that's easy. That's the positive. Sam and Scorpio and Fonzie. Easy one, that. Uh, the weirdest or strangest weapon that a fan brought to the show? I remember the weirdest. We've had everything from weed whackers to the kitchen sink, the real kitchen sink, to the guy who took his prosthetic leg off and handed it to one of the wrestlers who used the prosthetic leg in the match, which, of course, they duplicated years later in WWE. But what did they duplicate? But yeah, that was the first time we ever saw that. That was a Mad Dog for Sean, I think. That was the Shawn Michaels Diesel thing, then they ripped off Mad Dog for Sean's prosthetic leg for the finish. I didn't remember what it was, but they had done it after we did it. Yeah. Uh, I, we didn't do it. It was spontaneous. I just actually hated them as they're walking through the crowd, beating each other to death. And that was what 
a really unique part of what we did is that they would go through the crowd half the night. And that crowd, as smart as they are, were so respectful. They cleared it out. They didn't, you didn't need security. They policed themselves. No one ever reached in and grabbed it or touched it. They just, because they saw these guys were beating the shit out of each other, two inches in their faces. They weren't throwing these work, you know, in the elbow. They were cracking each other with chairs. And these guys were like two feet away going, holy shit. You know, I'm not touching those guys. Like, they, they let them go anywhere they want. They never interfered in a match ever in any city we ever went to, anywhere. I've got so many here. I'll, I'll try and limit it a bit. Um, a bit of a cheeky question. Favorite firing? You can tell. You can tell me to skip that one because that's a bit of a snidey question. Yeah, to ask. I don't know that I fired anybody other than Shane, which is a work in the ring, which is my favorite firing angle. Where I acted like I was going to beg him to stay, and then stood up and fired him instead. He said, "You get down on your hands and knees and beg me to stay. I won't go to the WWF." I got down on the one knee and I said, on behalf of myself, all the fans, all the rest of the dressing room, Shane, my store said, you're fired. And then he took me out. 9-1 came down, gave him a choke slam, and off he went to WWE land. Did, did you know what? There was, a, there was, a, was he wearing the Monday Night Raw t-shirt at the time? Because yes. I heard there was a rumor that he didn't tell anyone that he was going to wear that before he went out. No, I don't remember that. Being, I, it could be. I don't remember that being the case. But he was wearing that shirt during the angle when I went to fire him. All right, I'll have to ask Shane next time I speak to him. Um, <clears throat> Maybe he'll remember that like from the booking meeting. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the most dangerous situation you ever found yourself in? Well, my pers- I've never had a personal dangerous situation. Uh, me and the dangerous situations were worrying about being sued and losing everything during the chair-throwing incident in the arena. When fucking cactus got the whole building covered the ring with chairs, and Teddy and Johnny, the public enemy, were underneath the chairs, and they just kept coming and coming. And rather than just like put a halt to it, Funk's encouraging it. Mitch like going, cactus like easy, and Funk around, come on, throw him, throw him. The chairs that hot, you know, that was scary because one of the chairs thrown from the building hit somebody in the front row and just made to the ring. You know, that's a pretty good lawsuit right there. Um, Another time it was in Florida. Public Enemy last match of the night. They won the match. They're dancing. They invite a couple of kids in the ring to dance with them. And next thing you know, 50, 100. Or the, the whole audience is trying to get into the ring. The ring just went <laughs> and collapsed. My heart's going, you know, who's going to sue me next? I mean, my God, there's not enough insurance in the world to cover some of these suits that could have happened. But they didn't, thank God. But I never found myself in any personal danger. And what did Paul do with the chair throwing incident and the ring collapse? He put them in the intro. Of course, they're great visuals. <laughs> I know you must have you must have been like, oh my god, this is going to encourage more of this. No, not really. They did try to emulate it once or twice in other buildings, but the rest was kind of right off. You know, they knew already like that. That was a one time thing. It was magic, whatever. Thank God nobody got killed, nobody got hurt, no one got sued. Not to, not take a chance another time. Not to mention the fact that I might have made it clear in the back. Hey, I dare you to ask somebody to throw a chair in there because that'll be your last night here. Uh, are you surprised that ECW and you personally wasn't sued more? Because I think the only two lawsuits that I remember, as you said, was the chair fire thing and also the mass transit thing. Were they the only two lawsuits the company suffered through? Well, yeah. Um, the mass transit happened after I had given up ownership of the company. So I wasn't really involved in that at all. The fire one, yes. That was, that was just a nightmare. Mm. They're doing the flaming tape, uh, flaming uh, baseball bat, barbed wire bat, funk and cactus over the match. And some or other towel f- flew off the bat and got on the floor, so something was burning on the floor. The chair, the chair, not the bat. Yeah, the, yeah, the chair, thank you. Yeah. And get in the front row, got a guy in the front row, reaches through, he's trying to help us. You know, he's patting it out with his hands. He's drunk off his ass. And, and of course, he burned his hands doing that. The fire did not go, reach, go across the barrier to him. He came across to try to help reach him through. Um, we brought him into the back. You know, loaded him up with T-shirts and autographs and, like, you know, try to, you know, control this guy as best we could. He always lose burnt hands going, and anybody got a cigarette? So he's smoking a cigarette. It's like, but we felt, you know, I felt bad. I mean, he was trying to do something nice for us. He wasn't trying to, like, 
burn himself. So everybody really, really, like I said, we stocked him up with everything we could to take home with him. And then I guess six months later, it was the lawsuit came in and all of a sudden now he can't have sex. Now he can't sleep at night. Now, and it was, if he had come in and sued us for just the damages to his hands, I think he would have had a one, he'd have won the case. But they came in with such ludicrous claims. The judge says, you know, how could I possibly award you for coming in here and saying, you can't ride your motorcycle and we can't, you can't work. When, when did, was the last job you held? About 12 years ago. I mean, you can't work now because of the fire. You know, worked in 12 years. Like, come on. Like, it was so, it was so out of, it was ridiculous. And it became a frivolous lawsuit got thrown out. But I remember that day those letters came into my offices to me, to Paul, to Stream, to Funk, to Cactus. I'm like, holy shit. We've all got to go to court. But none of them we had to get up and testify. So it was thrown out. Where did the footage go? Because there's lots of there's photos of uh, cactus holding the you know the fire chair, but uh, I don't think the footage has ever been released. Yeah, we were. Uh, you know, there was footage that could be harmful. We certainly didn't want to go anywhere, be seen by anyone, so it was probably a race of time. Hmm. I'd, I'd sort of yeah, I sort of figured that might be the case, but I was wondering if there was like somewhere somehow you had like. Someone had a copy somewhere. Dodge. No, it was just gone. No, no. Uh, I'm gonna. Ooh, I'll probably ask a couple more, then we'll carry on. Um, no, that's a rubbish one. The nicest person in wrestling. Hey, that's a rubbish one. No, that was a shit. I was about to ask a really shitty one. Um, some about oh, the, the town with the most eager ladies, but it's Philadelphia. We all know that. Um, yeah. So uh, the nicest person in wrestling. Two gold Scorpio. Really. Yeah. He is a sweetheart of a guy. I love that guy. I mean, he has a room here. Uh, he stayed here so many times, not for ECW, actually, later on iterations of shows that I ran. Um, he'd come every month, and he had a room where it got to the point where you know, my three kids' rooms, and they called Squirt's room. Like, if I'm going to make up Squirt's room, he had his own room. Uh, I trusted him with my family. I trusted my kids. He was he was great. He still is great. We just talked to him in the last... We never even went a week or two without talking to, amongst the four of us. I just talked to Squirt less than a week ago. That dude is fun as well. I've, I interviewed him uh, about 18 months ago as well. I wasn't prepared for just actually genuinely how nice and how funny he was. He was so engaging. He was a really great interview. Um, Anyone who was saying? Did I understand? Yeah, of course I did. We only got like 50%. We were the best friends. <laughs> Just, it's the same with like a you know Tommy Rich or someone like that. It's like James, can you understand what I'm saying? Like, I can understand you perfectly, dude. Like because we like we used to like Australian actor. We've got every accent under the sun here, so you know we're all used to. Uh, I'll ask you two more. Worst injury you ever saw? I guess Sal Blomo's eye. I don't know this. Uh, when Rock and Rebel hit him with a chair. And didn't protect him. He hit him right in the face of his eye. And he almost lost the eye. And he was out. We thought his career was over. Uh, we started getting hope. They started setting up home movies and stuff of him from when he was, you know, playing with his kids. How will never be able to do that again. And finally, he was able to heal. But that night, it looked like he was hanging out of his socket. It was, it was gruesome looking. And he came back to that dress when he was screaming, What? I got it. Where is that? Like one of the things, like it was my my doing that he got hit like that. And I said, Sal, you know, <clears throat> what we got to do to fix you? What you fix? But I had nothing to do with that. I was down at ringside. I was telling Rebel to hit you like that. And he and I stayed friends for, you know, he lived in Jim Thorpe where we used to run once a month. He was the night before the arena shows. Sal was a character. Yeah, he seems to have like a complete different character in ECW. Like, was he coming out in some sort of like half gladiator kind of affair at one point? Yeah, he was coming out like the gladiator with the long hair. He just wanted to change his gimmick around. I mean, people who knew him, unfortunately, knew him from the WWF. They knew him wearing the, you know, Italy uh, one piece and doing the cartwheels around the ring. And he wanted to change his image to try to get over. Because he was definitely not over like that, especially in Philadelphia. They hate that kind of baby face. They hate the long hair, good looking baby face. They hate the guys doing the cartwheel baby face. That's the sticky old town. They had no shot of getting over like that. So he was smart enough to change up, change it all up. 
And uh, this may be a bit of a two part of this one to end it on. Uh, most legit badass. Brian Lee and 911. Either one of those guys, especially 911, if you shot him, you better shoot him 10 times. One bullet's not going to stop that guy. He's a beast. He was huge and thick and muscular and powerful. I remember, you know, we used to get his rent his ring. I can never forget coming one night, pre show, of course. There's three guys, you know, that he's on his crew. They're listening to this big bar and they're walking. He goes, What are you guys doing? He goes, We're trying to get this thing in the ring. He goes, Come here. He picks it up <laughs> from the three guys who were struggling with it in his arms. He cradles it, walks it over to the ring and went, who is that guy? Oh my god, like a straight Superman. So yeah, that's Roots of the Jets. <laughs> With a 911, uh, what was your favorite choke slam he gave? Because, I mean, for Santa. I guess by the National Anthem guy. I don't know that one. I don't know the story what happened. Uh, we had a, one of our guys who were part of the lighting crew, played electric guitar. And so he came out to play the National Anthem on the electric guitar before the show started. And he's doing it out great. And then all of a sudden, like, miss a note. And then he's over while he missed another note. And then, blah, 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 knock him. Then the music, he gave that to the guy while he's playing the National Anthem. Holding his guitar and choke slam him on the top stage. That was one that comes to mind pretty quickly. I still feel bad for Francine. What was that, the first thing she ever did? And she took the t- choke slam as well. Yeah, that was my we real farmer's market. We probably had a crowd of 100. And uh, we brought her out and called her the Montgomeryville. Again, it's such a small, small town. Uh, Miss Montgomeryville, we're wearing the sash. I mean, you think these people at the show in a town of maybe 500 would know that there was no such thing as Miss Montgomeryville? No. They're oh, this is Miss Montgomeryville. <laughs> what? This is hysterical. So he, when he picked her up and jokes landed her, that was, uh, that was shocking to them. They, they, they were like an old fashioned, old time crowd who you know, cheered the babies, booed the heels. And, they were shocked by that. On that same show, I think I played a small rib of Bob Ortiz. The after that happened, I wrote in the back of a piece of paper saying, you're a pretty good-looking guy I never noticed before, or something like that. I go running out to the ring, and I go, Bob Ortiz, that chokes that too. You read this to these people. You tell them what they're... And he took me, he didn't know what's going on. So he goes, okay, okay. He's the commissioner who brought me out to it here. And then I go out of the ring, and he opens up, and you see him trying not to, you know, not to laugh. And he's like, fuck, he's got his head closed me here. The commissioner says, 911 is going to be punished. Wherever he came back and said, but boy, he took like 10, 20 seconds against composure to go to speak in that microphone. And he opened that thing and said, oh, shit, there's nothing on here for me to read to these people. Uh, <laughs> well, why didn't 911 uh, wrestle more? He wrestled for years. No, no, but he, he always seemed to be like the bodyguard. He was never like, he never had like a big uh, sort of single that, run. That's what his career, James. Hmm? That's what killed his career. I, he said, I want to wrestle matches. Paul and I sat down and said, Al, are you crazy? You're like one of the most over guys in the entire company, and you don't have to do anything. They chant for you at every show. And they didn't, we're going to put a spot in there or something that's going to make them want to chant for you at every show. All you do is you walk out and you choke slam and you're done. And you're over like crazy. You sell pictures, you get order. Why would you want to wrestle? I want to wrestle. I want to do it. He insisted. So put him in a feud with... Um, uh, I'm sorry. The lawn mower out here. All time now. Um, Ron Simmons. And it was dreadful. I mean, dreadful. So then from there, we put him in the tag team with Ray Mysterio. You know, talk to Reagan, jump off his shoulders and do spots and things like that. But that was the end of his career for the most part. Once he tried to wrestle, he killed him. Yeah, I think he went WCW, he fed him to the giant, and then he was done. And then that was pretty much it. Yeah. No one to see him anymore once he started wrestling. Like, there was no reason no one, they, ever calling him to come after him to show anymore and jerk that somebody. Uh, the last one in the segment's most memorable backstage fight. I tell you right now, the only fight I even ever remember seeing, ever, 
was uh, New Jack and Dances with Dudley. And that was in Jim Thorpe, where they had a match in Dances with Dudley's. And match is over, and it's really dark in this dressing room. There were a mountain, and there's no lights back there. It's like a little lamp. Really dark and small, crowded. And apparently, Jack went back to the, the, the flapjack, waiting for him to come out from the ring. When he got back from the curtain, he whacked him on the head, busted him open. And then the brawl, you know, it was like a crazy brawl, and it was it was nuts. And we'd never had that ever before in our dressing room, and never had it again after. It's funny. We never brawl. It's funny that you say New Jack because I was thinking, I bet, I bet Todd says New Jack. Because I've heard about four New Jack fight stories, at least, told to me on this show. Not when I was there. No one ever happened in the dressing room with that one. Hello, we had a little break there and a good 20-minute talk about films that we we didn't record and we probably should have done. It was very entertaining. Uh, we're going to move on. I'm going to ask you some more ECW questions, of course. And I also said, well, I was going to talk to you about the Shane Douglas title thing, and I'm sure we could have a good laugh at Dennis Carluso's expense. But I'm going to move on to the next question. and. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about this before, is Shane Douglas at one point around 94 starts calling out Ric Flair. This was probably around the same time that ECW and WCW have a bit of a working relationship. And maybe at one point it seemed like Ric Flair might actually show up to uh, ECW. How close was that and what was the negotiations like and how sort of deeply involved were you in it? Well, it's very deeply involved in all of it. We had no working relationship with them whatsoever, really. Um, they had done something where they used one of our guys or they did something where they owed us, owed us one that we didn't make sue them over that we could have. Oh, we're, we're, uh, when worlds collide or something like that, they used that name right. for a paper. We had already done the same. Uh, was that, was that, was, the tri- was that the triple a, um, that was what the triple a pay-per-view was called as well. Wasn't it? I don't know for sure. Whatever it was they used, they kind of owed us one. So I called up Eric Bischoff. I said, uh, let's work this out. He said to me, I'll tell you what, he goes, if you ever want to run a show anywhere, and I'm again, I've never met this guy before, I've never spoken to him before. If you ever want to run a show anywhere near where Jim Cornette is running a show, even if it's right across the street, I will give you my entire roster to pick from for free. <laughs> I was like, uh, nice to meet you too. What the hell was that? I was like, wow. And the deal became that we ended up bringing in uh, um, Bobby Eaton and Arn Anderson, who were hot at the time. And that was one of the greatest angles we had done, because when they unmasked, that building had, for once, didn't know anything about anybody being there. So when the first Bobby unmasked, the place went berserk. And then when Arn unmasked, the roof came off the place. That was one of the great moments in my personal ECW history. But yeah, we was never a working relationship, and we never ever discussed bringing Ric Flair in, ever. Um, that was just Shane's thing. Yeah, you know, he wanted to. You know, I said Eddie wanted to be Lawler. Shane wanted to be Flair, and his goal was at some point first to elevate himself by just bringing Flair down, but then it was maybe he can get an angle going where he could get Flair to actually come in. Got him pissed off enough, but that wasn't even close to ever happening, ever. Was even discussed. I uh, well, when I talked to Shane, he was sort of saying that it was maybe relatively close at one point because Flair was on the outs with WCW, and who knows, maybe Flair was using ECW as a leverage, uh, you know, to try and get re-signed for a better deal in WCW. I, I don't, I don't know why it didn't happen, or that's all I know really. Well, as I said, I, I never heard anything from Flair or his camp, his people, or WW about him ever wanting to come here or be used here. Surely we would have done it. You know, that was available to us. It would have been worth the price, believe me, whatever it would have been. Because uh, that would have been a hell of a draw. But we never. Shane's got his own. God bless him. I love Shane. You know that, right? But he's got his own sense of memories that are just like second to Sandman and being clueless. Uh, w- in the book, you mentioned your first meeting with Flair. What did he say? I was in a hotel lobby, I mean, hotel restaurant at the Hilton Hotel. I was having lunch with Shane, I'm sorry, with Kevin Sullivan and his wife, Nancy. And Flair gets off the elevator, walking towards the table, and he says, Hey, devil. So he called his nickname for Sullivan. And Kevin's like, Rick, I want you to meet my friend, Todd Gordon. 
He's running ECW now. You may, I told you about it. So he goes, how you doing, brother? Just want you to know, your partner's a pathological liar. <laughs> and turned away and walked away. And first of all, he wasn't my partner. I mean, he wasn't even an employee yet, basically. I'm like, what the hell was that? And that was my first introduction to Ric Flair. Did you uh, did you ever hear the stories of why Heyman was let go from WCW? Uh, something to do with falsifying uh, accounts for um, tick meals and tickets, airline tickets and things like that, and they caught him, so they fired him. <laughs> then he sued them, and he won, oddly enough. So go figure. Yeah, what was the basis of him winning that? I don't understand. I don't know. I mean, I think that he, him it was like a blip on their radar. They're a billion dollar company, so. We to get rid of the nuisance deals. Did uh, did the court find in his favor, or did they just settle to get rid of him? Um, that I don't know either. I know he got I know he got money out of it, which is why he didn't need money when he first came to work for us. I... He worked for free because he was really there, just trying to get guys over to bring with him to the uh, Crockett deal. But he brought in Public Enemy and Jason, and people were trying to get a look at and see if he could build them up to being ready for his big deal with WWN which, of course, didn't happen. And then we just kept them and rip over them. Mm. It was, right, so in my mind, WWN, the World Wrestling Network, I know there's another WWN, but in the original WWN concept, wasn't it meant to be, like, internet only? Or was it going to be a very early streaming or something crazy like that? No, I believe what it was was it was going to be the first one to be in, like, 3G or 4G, whatever the case was back then. It was, like, a whole different uh, kind of filming, a different level of film and taping that would be uh, revolutionary at that time. We've obviously passed that on five different generations since then, but it was, at the time it would have been revolutionary. And he also was going to bring that rock and roll grunge thing to it, mm. which was not done anywhere yet. Now, uh, I've already teed you up for this question beforehand as well, and I asked Shane this, and he, he said something about Johnny Grunge, and then I think he uh, trailed off. Uh, why was ECW banned from the Comfort Inn? It was one of the first ones we were banned from, I think. <laughs> we were banned from a few. Um, that wasn't the one in his pants. Though. That I think he was urinating in a fireplace in the lobby, possibly, and smoking joint at the same time. And we weren't over yet. We were like a year, say, within the next year, where people didn't care. People would, like the Holiday Inns and stuff, they were like, we want you here. We don't care what you do, basically, because you breathe. A shitload of people here every guys stay here. At that time, we were just kind of getting started. No one had heard of us. So the comfort in wasn't so, you know, apt to keep us there. But with Johnny Grunge, Johnny's, I can throw Johnny Grunge all day long because I love Johnny Grunge. I miss him terribly. Um, Cactus was going to win with a tag belt, I believe, the next on a Saturday night. And he brought his parents down from New York and stayed at the travel lodge, which is our, we called the Loser Lodge, which we spent most of our time. For the last couple of years. Was that the cylinder shaped kind of affair? Right. Yeah. Yep. And uh he comes and he knocks on my door. Yeah, it's morning. I go, What's up? Goes, Todd, I need you. All right, so I'm gonna close one and get out. Cactus we takes me down the hall. There's Johnny Grunge laying in the hallway, nine, ten in the morning, dressed with his pants around his ankles. Three maids standing around in a circle, going. Mister, Mister, you okay, Mister, Mister? I went, uh oh. We got it, we got it, we got it. Mates out of the way, get Johnny up. Turns out he thought he was going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, drunk as a skunk. Went out the door instead, going to the bathroom door, passed out in the hallway, pants got as far as the ankles, and that's where he remained till the next morning with Captain Fallon. I can't bring my parents out here, like, you know, to see this. Like, can you get him out of here? So I knocked on the door, got Ted Petty, Rocco Rock. <laughs> he helped me with me, drug him in the room. He had no recollection, but Johnny was special. He, it's a funny, funny thing. I mean, when he went to WCW, first night he was there, he stole the production truck. What? David, it's production truck. To drive into the hood to get blow, <laughs> figured he'd be back. You know, before anybody would know what's going on. With the WCW logo on it and everything. Yeah. Giant production truck. Oh, no. So he had heat the first night he was there, and Ted Petty texted me, he goes, dude, 
we're not going to be here for long. Johnny's already getting his fired first night in. But Dusty liked Johnny too. There was something about, he was, we called him my a retarded puppy. He was, he was unique and special. And he was real. He was just a good dude. So the next day, there was, there was taking a bus with all the wrestlers to go to the next town, keep them all together. And Dusty arranged for these cops, or maybe they're fake cops, maybe they're real. They come and they get Johnny Grunge off the bus. The server has to take in a rescue for stealing a vehicle. Said, what do you mean? They put me cuffs on me. Goes, I didn't steal it. I just borrowed it. it was only Johnny. He didn't see that as stealing. He said, that was just borrowing. It wasn't stealing. And uh, they, let him off. they told him it was a joke or rib. They let him go. But <laughs> he, saw, he saw that as borrowing. He didn't see that as stealing. <laughs> we just, uh, towards the end. Sorry, sorry go ahead. No, no, no. Please carry on. Towards the end, it got sad. He said it was over. We're doing Shane Douglas was doing reunion shows. And we did a weekend in Cleveland and then Pittsburgh. In Cleveland, it's a movie theater set. So it's like Files went up, 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 up down to the ring in the center. And he's supposed to work a match with Gary the Pitbull. And Shane's supposed to be running the show, but Gary knows where he was. Nobody backstage is running anything. So I'm trying to help out, of course. Now, your next match is going to be Johnny Grunge and Pitbull. Gar- and Where's Johnny? I thought mean, well, somebody was going up for food. That's all the way up in the lobby. I was, you know, those dirty, you know, whatever, flights of steps. So I'm running all the way up, trying to find Johnny Grunge. He's in line. Popcorn, hot dog, he's eating it. And Johnny, your back is in the ring right now. Oh, shit. He hands me his food. And I'm going, okay. And he goes running down this, forever to get down there. Because it was, a, you know, a lot of steps to get down that ring. Get to the ring. This is the spot. And by then, he had put on so much weight. You knew he was not going to last long. He had like a 56 inch waist by then. Goes to leave the ring. He got stuck under the bottom rope. The rope and the ring. And he could, he was literally stuck. He could not move. He couldn't get through. Now I'm watching this going, oh my God. I know I'm treating like it's my show. It's not. But meanwhile, I'm trying to help. I run and go with Gary. Come back to the ring. Get, get Johnny out of the ring. What do you mean? Like he's stuck under the bottom rope. Gary's like, Jesus fucking Christ. And Gary opens the other, push, you know, push some prod to get him out. So the next night, uh, she goes, eh, Johnny, we're going to have you just be out in the ring when we do the end list. People have died. And Todd will read the list. And you just stand there and look, so, you know, right now you're wrestling on the next night. He goes, I, that's good. <laughs> so that, that was a Johnny Grunge story. Uh, do you know, you probably also answered one of the uh, upcoming questions was who were you most bummed out, you know, of the uh, main DCW stars who then went to WCW or WWF? But it sounds like it would have been Public Enemy that you were saddest to Absolutely. see go. Very, very close for them. I got them in there. They were going to go work for Vince. And that fed into, you know, Paul's whole Vince thing, but I didn't think Paul had anything to do with it. They were going to go work for Vince. So I called up to Kevin Sullivan to do, like, here's what Vince is offering them. You make them a better deal because I think they're worth more than that. If they're going to leave me. I respect that because they're going to make more money, but let's make them real money. So Kevin went to Bischoff, came back, made him a bigger offer, and they went to WCW instead. Mm-hmm. But resent the fact they were leaving at all. And I said, how can you resent anybody leaving who's been working for you for like two years now at two, three hundred dollars a night, breaking their neck, killing themselves, bleeding? So, I mean, this guy's our locker room was like a match unit for every show. <laughs> I mean, it was these guys really were beating the hell out of each other. And they'd be grudging one for 300 hours a night to, you know, 150, 200,000 a year. 300,000 a year. How, how did he begrudge them that? He didn't care. He sort of being disloyal. And I said, I think I, don't, I disagree. I feel like I owe them that. You gave Paul the rights to the tape library. When Paul sold ECW, I know he went through bankruptcy court and all that kind of thing as well. But uh, what happened with the royalties of. The ECW sale in the videotape library. Well, the videotape library was part of a deal I made, an exit deal, uh, in terms of uh, a buyout, basically getting to get my money back that I invested. So that was part of the transaction at that point. But it didn't have to be. It didn't have to be any transaction. That was the deal I cut for myself with the tape library being my only real leverage there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could have said you can't use the name, you can't use this. I mean, I owned all of that solely. He had no, no right to any of that, but in exchange for those rights, I was going to get back X amount of dollars a week, a month, so I was whole again. I'm going to ask something more fun now, uh, in a sense. Uh, how many times did the Sandman die? At least twice. 
maybe three times. When, when we say die, I mean, his heart has stopped. He is clinically dead, and somehow he rises back up from the dead. Sabu told me a story. One of the times he died, he basically said, we were in our trailer or wherever we were, we were doing something we shouldn't have been doing, and then all of a sudden, Sandman keels over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember one time he was down at Fonty's house on New Year's. He and Peaches and Fonty and Fonty's then wife, I think it was, and he squalled me up rah, 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 the next day. He was, he was always not there. I spoke to these guys almost every day. I mean, it's a very unusual friendship set that we have that 30 years later we still talk all the time, like like nothing's changed. Um, I think they took him to the hospital then. And most recently when he stopped drinking, they took him to the hospital because nobody knows the story. He decided to stop drinking on his own. And by the third day, one morning his kid put someone in to get him and he was frothing at the mouth. They had to call you know, the EMT, they had to call the ambulance in, they brought him to the hospital. And he almost died that time too. And that was the day he said, that's it. When you see your kid come in and see you ready to die. And you think, I did that to him, let him see that. I can never do that again. It's two months in so far, he's completely sober. Uh, also in the book, you, meant, you mentioned that uh, you deserve the credits for letting Jim be Jim. Because beforehand, he was the surfer, uh, you with you know with the surfboard, the whole bit. And then I believe it was you. Well, tell me what you suggested. I believe Paul didn't think it would work. Yes. Um, first of all, no one calls him Jim. I don't think I've ever heard anybody call him Jim. Sorry, so I was really... Excuse me? He's been called Hack, five years old. You ask him why, he says, I don't know. My brother started calling me that. And ever since then, the whole world's called me Hack. He has no idea why, but that's his name. <laughs> so uh, he was not getting the surfboard thing. was just a disaster. Number one, again, you can't be a good heel or a good baby face coming out in Philadelphia with a surfboard. In a wetsuit. It's not going to get over no matter what you do in the ring. And someone else was already doing that as well, wasn't it? Sir for Ray Odyssey as well. In Ray Odyssey. Yeah. And um, I said, it sucks. I said, Paul, why don't we do something different with him? Why don't we let him be who he is? He's a barroom brawler. That's what he is. He's a guy at the end of the bar, pounding away, and hoping that every stupid and loudest one in the bar. And if someone says something, sure enough, that's either there's going to be a fight. That's who he is. Let's, let him use that as a persona. He says, yes, okay, I can see that. So we'll let him dress in the way he normally dresses in you know, blue jeans or whatever, work shirt. I said, but let's let him go to the ring smoking. He's smoking I go, and drinking. That's what he does. He says, the bar smokes and drinks. He says, nah, they can't do that. Why can't you do that? He says, well, you, you can't do that. I go again. Why can't you do that? And I learned one thing from Eddie Gilbert. He said to me, he taught me that you can do anything in wrestling. We we're doing a match where someone's top is going to get ripped off. And I said, I don't want to do that because those are always bait and switches. And I hated that when I used to watch wrestling. You know, you know the girl's top's not coming off. So we're going to cover up over the top. It's, it's, he said, let's do it. Said, you can't do that. He said to me, you can do anything in wrestling. And we did it. We're still existing. The commissioner came down hard on me the first night. Act as though I knew nothing about it. Like I didn't know it was going to happen. It was an accident. One suit and tie guy. You should know better than that. All right, all right, all right. All right. You let it go. But we did it. So why can't we have a smoking drink? So we did it. We let him go out like that. Instant success. And there was credit. Paul was something that had never been done before. He took that. And during every segment we had with him in the back of the interviews, Sam was always in black and white. The rest of the show was in color. Brilliant. Made him stand out from the show. Why is it black and white? Now you're paying attention. It was to see Sam Man. And back then he was with a woman as his manager. And when he would smoke that cigarette and blow that smoke through the black and white, that smoke coming at you, it was a mesmerizing effect. Soon, years later, NWO did the same thing. It was probably the first time we had done something first. It got emulated or re, you know, redone. And they did it great, too, obviously. But it was different because they had so many people involved in it. It wasn't the same as just the one guy sitting there smoking with his cane. 
and beer and a cigarette. He was like mesmerizing. And plus, he was good enough at what he did to get the gimmick strong. I mean, the last couple of years of the cruise, when I was there, he never won a match. He didn't want to win a match. He said, let's get this guy over. I'm already over. I can lose and lay there and have somebody pour beer in my mouth and do the Undertaker sit up and I'm back. I got my heat back. And it was great. And he realized, could you mean Dreamer? I don't think either one of them won a match for like almost two straight years. But you would never realize that watching it. So you'd actually look back and go, oh, how about that? They really didn't. Because they were generous and they were smart. And you had, they, once they were over, they knew who was about to get other people over. Instead of being selfish, you always wanted to be the top guy. Following on from that, ECW innovations that you and or Paul just don't get credit for that obviously maybe the big two, WWF and WCW at the time, did get credit for that maybe rankles somewhat? Nah, at this point, I don't think so. I mean, the three-way dance, nobody now it's as commonplace as, you know, having five men in the ring, three men, every man for himself with a scramble. There's never more than two people in the ring before. You know, Jim Cornette disputes that. He thinks that maybe he invented the triple threat or three-way dance, or maybe he thinks someone before both of you did. But I don't know. I don't know who he would have done it with, but I think when we did it with Shane and Funk and Sabu, I'm pretty sure that was the first time it had ever been done. That was the night the lines crossed, because that was the night we knew. We got back to that hotel, and there was hundreds and hundreds of people outside the hotel doors and in the lobbies and the bar there. We couldn't get in. They start going, thank you, Todd. Thank you, Paul. Then we're going, what the hell? Are you, are you, you must be used to that. You've been in the big time before. He's Todd, I've never seen this before in my life. If we got something here, we got lightning in a bottle here. We're going to figure out what to do with it. I won't, I won't spoil what's in the book, but uh, someone's wife faints during that match. I won't spoil the punchline, though. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more, then we'll, do, uh, then we'll go to the main event, and then I will thank you for your time, and we'll Plug the book for all it's worth as well, even more. Um, I've got so many questions to ask. I'm, I'm just scanning through the page and I've been for the last couple of minutes. <sighs> Brian Pillman and ECW. I know you're probably going to say New Jack was like the most off the wall, genuine character in ECW history, but Brian Pillman must have been a close second. Did you realize you were sort of, I mean, did you think you were playing with fire when he sort of came in that short amount of time? He was only in for a couple of shots. People think it was longer. Originally, a couple shots that he came in for. You know, he'd come in after the show started. You know, he'd do his little, you know, go over his stuff in the back. He'd go out to the ring and do it. And then he'd leave. I mean, he wasn't really a long-term player there. Um, he wasn't as crazy, obviously, as he would pr- pretend to be in the ring. Although, I will tell you about it one night. And this is not in the book. When we went to the hotel room, one of the hotels, after a show. And somehow or other, it ended up being just me. Sam Ann and Brian Pillman. I don't know how that happened, but that's what it was. So everybody's doing some drugs and storing some coke and just smoking and drinking. And uh, all of a sudden, he gets into a character. We're all sitting there just talking. And he goes, you know what the Turk is? No. The guy who cuts you in football. During training camp of the pros. You see the Turk coming. You're hoping he's not coming to your locker. He comes to you and says, come on, talk. you need to come with me or whatever. You're getting cut. And that guy's name is the Turk. And all of a sudden, he starts marching around on the bed. I'm the Turk. And I'm, and I'm looking at Hack. And Hack goes, dude, is this guy fucking ribbing us or what? It's just the three of us sitting there. And no one's ignoring him. Like, he's in his own world. So that was kind of a scary moment. There were a couple like that. One with Terry Gordy. There were a few moments that were like scary. I thought these guys were in an OD right in front of me. Uh, but yeah, that was the extent of my real relationship with Brian Pillman was watching him walk around across the beds screaming about the Turk cutting him in football. <laughs> with did you realize why he was there, Brian? Because I think the whole story goes because he was close with Meltzer, and and I think he sort of said the story long after, and also his book that he was sort of using ECW to then get a better deal with either WCW or WWF. But I think he was trying to go to the WWF. Was this something you were aware of at the time, or he told you, or? Was this all well, in his I, mind? I everybody knew at the time that when he was using this angle being fired like by Kevin Sullivan, hey Booker man, you know, fire him. like he wanted to get fired, but they wanted to do a storyline. And he said he got them just to believe that if they did it in real life, people would really buy it. So when he came back, 
wow, that'd be a great angle. But he was already working five steps ahead. If you get them to fire him, you'd hopefully parlay that in some big events. So we were like that bridge in between. So it didn't look like he went right to Vince. So there would be a lawsuit between WCW and WWF. So him coming over those few spots, and it gave us a nice little rub too. Obviously, you know, getting a name for off a TV like that's always helpful. When he turned over that broken leg or broken ankle, everyone must have been, oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> what was is that the hum? That was the Hummer accident, wasn't it? I I believe it was. <laughs> I'm not really that familiar with that too as much, but yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, I don't know. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll ask a couple of ones in the big one. Um, this is something I'm very <laughs> interested. In. I know. I, I stretch this out like crazy, and also I like That's, talking. This, to you. I, I told you we do another one. I'm telling you, oh, dude, don't tempt me because that'll definitely happen. Let me tell you. Um, you'll know this more than anyone, and t- if you don't want to answer it because the entire answer is in the book, then we'll skip. But it's been long said that Vince McMahon was financially backing ECW to a small extent as he saw the promotion as a feeder system of sorts ever since, you know, the territories disappear. Uh, Paul has only admitted to receiving $1,000 a week or a month, I think it was a week, after Vince poached Two Cold Scorpio because there was a deal with Tommy Boy Records where they would advertise for $1,000 a week during Two Cold Scorpio's entrance, and that was sort of like to cover the losses of the advertising. Is that the extent of it, or was Vince actually well, subsidizing more? Jim Ross, now see, I don't know the numbers, because I didn't know he was working behind my back with Vince, which is a big underlying thread through the book, too. Mm-hmm. But according to Jim Ross, he was making like some crazy number. I, I saw it written somewhere like 75000 a month, or something like that, or 50000 a month. He was getting, Jim Ross said he was cutting the checks. And that's in his book and his own couple of his podcasts that Ross says they were paying for a lot of money, a lot of money on the table to keep the whole company afloat. Well, per month, per week, or? Per, per, I, I wish I had that detail with me. They had it like not that long ago. Someone else had brought it up, but he was paying him. I'd have to look it up. I could look it up in maybe like five minutes. But it, was a, it was a crazy number that Jim Ross claimed they were paying him. Uh, I think I've got the book somewhere as well. I'll, I'll find that out for a, a later date. But uh, did you uh, did you ever meet Vince? Because I know there was like crossover uh, storylines at one point, ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah, I met, him, I met him one time when we did the uh, Raw Invasion, where the whole company came out. But it was a brief, nice to meet you. And, you know, he's going through the line, so to speak. Hello, Dudley. I was saying, man, uh, it's Todd Gordon. Oh, oh, Todd, nice to meet you, Todd. It's nice to meet you too. Okay. How did that all come about? Was that a Paul thing? Put putting a word. Paul, Paul. I didn't want to do it. Oh really? No. Our whole everything we said and saying for three years on television or four years is we hate the WWE. We're the anti WWE. Their cartoons were real. They're shooting needles in their ass with steroids. We're just going out there and beating the shit out of each other. They're the we're the anti WWE. Our fans are smart enough to know. That it would show up there that there's some kind of working relationship. We're not really going to truly invade another company's thing without going to jail. You know, we throw up all of us be arrested. So they knew that. But Paul's attitude at this point now is his decisions to make because I stepped away from that at 95. Uh, his attitude was this uh, more people will get eyes on our pay per view. Then we get more eyes, it's worth it. And I said, if we undo everything we stood for, then our loyal, hardcore fan base. Was one we can't afford to lose. We're gonna drift off. It didn't really, but I was I was dead set against that whole WWE thing. I like how WWF got Rob Van Dam and you got Brackus. D- doesn't somehow it doesn't seem like a fair trade. Hardly. <laughs> but Van Dam always wanted the big stage. He always did. Uh, let me have a look here. Um, I'm gonna go straight into the. Oh, by the way, before I forget, did you ever watch WWE's version of ECW? Not for, not for long. No. I think it was The Mummy or every day and once came out, I was done. Oh, the zombie on the first one. Yeah, that was it. That's all I had to say. <laughs> did you watch the One Night Stands, the pay-per-views? I did watch the One Night Stand. I found that. I had issues about it. Mostly with Paul. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was very... 
Everything he does, he does with thought. He's a brilliant guy. To the end, of, and I didn't. I forgot to put that part in the book too, or maybe it was cut. They cut so many pages out because I could have gone on like this. I go on forever. <clears throat> At the end of the night, he takes the microphone to thank the audience and thank everyone. He says, "I'd also like to thank the guy who hired me in the first place, Todd Gordon, and before anybody could even react, just and our cameraman Rod the phone." I thought, "Well, that was a fucking left-handed shot." <laughs> How was that? Me and the cameraman. Is that the level of my contribution to the, to the company? You, who I hired and carried along and put you over in front of all the drawn sheets and the, every, everywhere I went, I put them over to legitimize him. And who do the wrestlers? We're wary. I mean, I gave him that springboard. And thanks to you and the cameraman. You know, it was pretty well over by then. Yeah. But he could have thanked the guy who popped the corn as well. I mean, if it's, yeah. if, it, if it's going to be put well, in that context. I forgot to put that in the book. And it, that was this, a moment that was like, wow, stung a little bit. Mm. It doesn't make me a hero. Don't diminish me either. Uh, it's a shame. Yeah. Why didn't it make the book? Is it just... just, it, just it may like, have been the... I don't remember. Listen, that book was done like this. Sean hammered me for a year and a half to do a book. And I said, no, no, no. We had done a couple of DVDs together. Shoot DVDs. Mm-hmm. I don't want to write a book. It's too much time. I don't, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't do it. Finally, I agreed to do the book. And what we did was, throughout the pandemic and whatever it was, for about eight months straight, I would just Zoom with him like I'm with you and do what we're doing now. He said, tell me a story about the And I told him 30. And he'd roar and I'd roar. And he had to go back and rewatch it, try to extrapolate any kind of a sense of order and figure out what came in what order and put them all chronologically. All I do is tell stories for eight months, a couple of hours one day, six hours one day, two hours one day. He just went on and on and on. And out of that, as I said, I don't remember, I couldn't remember half the stuff that didn't get in there. He's got all those tapes, but yeah, I forgot. I don't know why I didn't remember that. He never asked me about one night stand. Hmm. But I would have brought it up like you did. That's what sparked my memory. Did um during the writing or you know telling of all these stories and then being put into book form, did your opinion change on anybody that you worked with previously after you know you finally sort of sat there and thought about it? You know, twenty five, thirty years in the future and times past. Um, not really. I think I I'm a pretty good judge of character. Well, I wasn't obviously for some people, but uh, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character, and I. It's easy for me because I don't ever have to remember what I say because I, I just tell the truth. And you, you ask any person who ever worked for me, and there were tons of them, were the one, more than just ECW and more than just one wrestling company. No one will ever tell you I ever lied to them once, ever. No one. One thing you're afraid to lie in a guy six foot seven, three. <laughs> <laughs> but it's easier just you don't have to remember what you said. You just tell the truth. Or you say, I can't answer that. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. But you don't lie. You don't work these, and you know, this is the only business in the world where it's not called lying because you're working somebody. Well, no, you're lying to them. <laughs> you know, you're not really working them when you're telling them an outright bold faced lie. But whatever, cakes are off, Oh, well, I don't know. There's alternative facts now as a saying, isn't it? So that's yeah. politics for you. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's go to the main event. Sort of similar to the name association. I'm just going to give you some names. And this is a segment I definitely didn't steal from Sean many years ago. <clears throat> Sorry, Todd. Hey, baggy, are you? <laughs> no, no, I'm not doing the dick bag thing. No, I'm just going to give you some names and you just give me your impression of them for the most part. I'm sure you'll say they're good. Apart from maybe this first one that I'm going to launch into you with, Ian Rotten. Ian Rotten, uh, second smelliest guy in the locker room. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was a good guy. I mean, he, his body shape did not give him a chance to like ever be something more than what he was. Um, but he and Ian had some definitely had a place on the card. I mean, people look forward to the Rottens coming out. Uh, we again, like I said, I always hated being lied to at work as a fan saying we're wearing somebody's shirt off and not doing it. So, anything we said was a stipulation, we stuck with it. So, when we said one of these two tag teams or three tag teams is going to break up, they can never work together in this building again, we never went back on it. Ian and Axel never worked as a tag team again. And they worked on our shows for years after that. 
three one, but never to attack you again. Excellent enough with balls. He did his own thing. Um, we promised a stipulation, and we wanted people to stick with it forever. Is to know that we promise them something, we deliver it. We don't jerk them around and come back with a mask for them. Like Kerry Von Erich. Uh, <laughs> with uh, with that being said, I, like cause I had quite a lot of the old tapes, maybe from like 94 to 96 kind of thing when I was a young teenager. I remember them saying, these young British punks. And even back then, it was like, they're not even attempting an accent. No. They just had the they, Union flag they, knee they, pads. I think that Axel did when he was in WCW for a short bit before he came over to uh, ECW, who he started, because then would keep him very long. And he was like an enhancement guy. I think he tried to do one back then, but I'm not sure if I remember that right. But for us, no, they didn't bother. To, you know, <laughs> everybody, everybody knew they weren't British lads. Mm. Why did Paul not like Ian? <sighs> he didn't like many people, to be honest with you. But there was someone who, like, you know, so bothered, you know, stuck, bothered him basically. You know, going up, want to talk to you about the match, or want to talk to you about money, or whatever it may be. He said you know, he, could, he couldn't take it. He didn't like him. He didn't like Jason. There were a lot of people he didn't like. Uh, and Jason made money for him. He didn't let him make money for us. I, uh, that name might be coming in in a minute. Uh, I'll leave Kevin Sullivan out. We talked to him out a bit. We talked a bit about Francie. Did you, did you bring in Dawn Marie, or was that after you left? Um, after. Okay, we'll talk about Francine then. Francine came to my office. She was about 18, maybe. Tall, thin girl. She was a wrestling fan. Just wanted to try it. She wanted to take a shot at it. I didn't know her father was outside the car waiting for her, just in case the big bad promoter guy was like being there with a cigar. But she walked into a like, nice little jewelry store. She's like, oh, am I in the right place? And I interviewed her. And I'm, she, of course, you know, what the school would cost and what it would entail. And she went to, went to school, did all the, did all the bumps. You know, J.T. Smith was her trainer. Rocky Ribble tried to take him, take her away from him. He said, I'll take care of her. And it was like one session. She came back and she was like, I don't want this guy to be my trainer. He should have been in the first place. So J.T. took back over. And uh, she went from this timid little thing. It was paranoid to even be at ringside as Ms. Montgomeryville. Becoming like an amazing buff machine. The stuff that she took and tried and attempted, she had some serious iron balls on her. I mean, she really did. And you would never have done anything to matter from the beginning. But she turned out to be the queen of extreme. And really, she was she was crazy. We uh I, yeah, I know we talked about 911 <coughs> choke slam. So she was game for anything, so good for her. Next name is Eddie Guerrero. Dean Malenko was in first because he was in for our NWA tournament to crown chain as the ECW champ. And he kept talking about Eddie saying, he and I, we have great matches. God, trust me. Bring him in, bring him in. And we, had, you know, we were aware of Eddie. <coughs> We've seen his, you know, stuff with Art Bar, you know, on tapes and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we were aware of who he was and we could see just while watching him that he was talented as hell. We had no idea how talented he was because we never really gave him the microphone had we known. That happened to a lot of people. Taz. We never gave Taz a microphone. He was jumping up and down going, eep, eep, eep. Until the one day we gave him the microphone for the angle where he turned on me against Fonzie and he just ran it. He was like amazing. So you never really know until you got a mic with a kid, Shane Douglas. He was a dynamic dude. He never spoke. He just rolled the, the, the wheels on his skateboard. But Eddie brought him in and he said, give me a chance to turn him heel and watch what he can do. And Eddie recommended it. He gave him the mic, let him go heel. I was a natural with a microphone. And a 60 minute program for us one time where he was the whole show because we were out of tape, nothing else was on the air. And he just gave him the microphone and he spoke for an hour. Who can do that? An hour. That's what we play off of like you and I. So yeah, with a tremendous with a microphone. Um, but Eddie, uh, we, we should have given him mic time. But he and Dean, and then Benoit with him, I hate to even say his name, but they had some phenomenal matches. Were you good? They were the rest of the show. You know, we had the comedy, the hardcore violence, the wrestling. We had every aspect of the business that I loved, but only the best parts of it. Were you uh, always going to bring an art bar? I wanted to. Um, he died, obviously. 
and uh, it was right about the time we brought Eddie in, not long after. Yeah, I didn't know if you were always planning on bringing them in as a tag team, or because it wasn't Art in Mexico at the time, or I don't know. I'm not sure. I just remember that we wanted to bring him in to work a program with Eddie. Uh, next one, Hack Myers. Hack Myers is just a you know local, relatively local, he's from Maryland, I think. Guy who was an enhancement talent, who for some reason the audience decided. Who, and by the way, they were as important as important a part of the show as any worker in that back was. And that's a fact. And they made Hack Myers. Why? Because when he would hit somebody, he would make you make a noise like sha sha, and they turn that into sha sha. Every time he hit somebody, be sha. You know, I would hit them back. They go shit sha shit, and all of a sudden we start calling the sha Hack Myers. And they they gave him that gimmick, the audience. So he went from being just an enhancer talent. To a guy who could be middle card talent and could be work baby face heel, you know, whatever the case may be. But they love to, you know, once they got that chant in their mind, anybody they had a chant for, they wanted to say. Mm-hmm. Because that way they got to be part of that that act, that spot in the show. So they kept Pac Myers working for years. Next one, Louis Spicoli. You know, I didn't really have much contact with Louis or much connection with Louis. He came in and uh, in the first or second night, he went to the diner across the street of the hotel and he passed out and mashed potatoes or something. And I heard that and I said, well, this guy's not going to be long for this company. Um, but he had support amongst some of the boys. So they wanted to make, especially Sabu. They were Sabu who brought Louis in. Sabu worked a lot, did a lot for a lot of people. Not a lot of people paid him back. And that's a shame. Because he deserves so much more than he's gotten out of his wrestling business and life. He really was such an innovator of so much. And by the time he would have been, you know, the internet set up to explode it for him and made him the bigger star that he could have been, he'd already broken his body to the smithereens. And it's a sin because he really doesn't like the credit for the money he should be getting for what he did for offered to the business itself. Absolutely. Love uh, Abu. Oh. Yeah. Curtis Hughes. Curtis, you well, you're some really obscure names here. Yeah, but that's, the, that's the point because normally th- these names would like never really come up. And you know, if we're just doing like an hour or two, I'd never say I'd forget about the Ric Flair story or forget about the mole or whatever. Let's talk about Curtis Hughes. <laughs> I love Big Cat Curtis Hughes. I remember we were driving in the Sandman van, and he was somehow or other, he was, you know, he had like 10 people if he wanted to. He was one of the people in the van, and we're driving along, and he said, uh, yeah, you know, how are you making money when you're not you're not wrestling anymore? He's not too often anyway. He's, well, sometimes I do the bucket gimmick. I don't know. Put this in the book. I forgot to. We're going with the bucket gimmick. What's the bucket gimmick? He's where I go out in the street, wear my hat, the white shirt, wear my full gimmick, wear a bucket. And I write charity on the bucket. And people put money in the bucket. And I work the bucket gimmick. Oh. Hack almost drove off the road. We were laughing so fucking hard. I mean, if you were saying to him that, he'd say, how about the bucket gimmick? He'd go, ah, oh, the bucket gimmick. Ah, oh, fucking Curtis Hughes. Yeah. Curtis was a character. I think, he might have, I think he might have Curtis Hughes coming on again, not to. Uh, right, so the bucket gimmick, that's the first question I've got to ask him about. Little Guido. Little Guido came to me with Tommy Cairo as a twosome. His name was Damien Stone at the time wrestling name. And they said, could we get a tryout? You know, we were, we were still small then. I said, well, yeah, but I don't know a spot for you right now. They go, well, just there's a tryout. So I was doing a show for free at uh, the Variety Club camp in the Gold Medal Center. It was a camp for children who were physically challenged. You know, we provided them with wheelchairs and braces, things that their families couldn't afford. So they said, we'll come out. I said, there's no payday out there. Now, you know, since it's a free show, I'm doing this because I'm involved with this charity. I'm a, that's a team president of the charity. And I, they said, sure. They came out and they did a match out there for me. They tore the place down. You could tell they'd done it a hundred times before, but it was so much better than anything else that was on the card. My guys were out there you know, doing it for the fourth and fifth time. They immediately had a place. And then Tommy just took off with that whole thing with beaches and, Stanley going, uh, pay your bills, Tommy Cairo. Damien, we're banging my wife. The whole thing elevated Tommy. Then Damien became Guido. And then the whole Italian, the F full blood Italians thing started, which thank God brought me Tommy Rich, who I'd 
dearly, dearly love Tommy Rich. Mm. Oh, he's such a good guy. Um, but yeah, he's a weirdo, and he's still working. You see him now, you he better shave. You know, like Ray, he used to shave the grades off right out the ring. You know, but he's, he's, he's a great guy. He's, so is Tommy. Uh, Tommy Rich is still working as well. Yeah, I know. I saw him at the convention in December. It was the first time I'd seen him in like 25 years. We couldn't let go of each other. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, I've got a few names left. John Cronus. You know, I didn't spend much time with him other than in the dressing room. I mean, he wasn't somebody like, you never, I didn't really see him parry much outside of the ring. There were certain groupings that like, kind of went off by themselves. <coughs> I believe Cronus ended up living in Philly, so he ended up having a place to go to at the shows. It wasn't at the hotels with all the other boys. I know he had issues with he and Perry had issues on and off. Perry didn't want to tag anymore with him. He wanted to be in singles. And um, so there's not much I can tell you about him. Hell of a hand. For his size, the things he could do, I mean, he could go over that top rope without touching anything. You know, he, he would fly. He, for a big guy like him, he could do a lot of stuff that no one ever realized he could do. Yeah. And the Perry going too far over because you want to make him out, you know, out get out soon. I uh, yeah, I always thought it was really weird as well because he always seemed like quite bottom heavy as well, but he seemed to fly really, you know, really well. Especially right. for his build. Body sheet would not indicate that at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh we uh, I'll leave that one out. Uh there's a couple of stories about her in the book, but Missy Hyatt. Missy I have such a history with Missy Hyatt. I mean she was the first person there was my in, inside contact to being in the business. When I was advertising on Joel Goodhart's radio show, and he said to me, you know, I said, how can I get a talent to come to the store for a personal appearance? He was, was commercial fed. You want somebody to make a personal appearance? Anybody. And he's named it off like, you know, this champion, that champion, like WWF. And WCF. I mean, the list was, went on and on. It was crazy. All people were having those Civic Center shows I was talking about, you know, the big name, one name after another, they're all available. So like any you know, real true-blooded, red-blooded wrestling fan, I, I wanted the best. So I said, I want Missy Hyatt. <laughs> he said, you want Missy Hyatt? I went, yeah. Does everybody? I mean, she was smoking hot. I mean, come on, it was 1992. She hadn't touched herself yet. And she was psh, ridiculous. So sure enough, that's why I brought her for the personal appearance. She came and took over the whole store, laying across the counters, you know, like, Larger than life, and I was like so shy around her too at the beginning. Not realizing it like 12, 10 years later, 12 years later, I mean, knocking her out in a match with Jasmine St. Clair because she was so high and couldn't perform. But along the way, we, we developed a nice relationship and friendship, especially with the fact she was a hack for a long time. Uh, there's another story about Missy Hyatt. I sort of knew it, but you put in a lot more details about Paul Varlins and the whole Taz thing. I'm not going to spoil it for you by the book. Next one Big Dick Dudley. Big Dick Dudley. Well, you are pulling out. This is great. I mean, nobody has about these, these people. It's so strange. Big Dick Dudley was like just let just underneath nine one one in terms of size, toughness. I and mean, this guy, nobody would mess with Big Dick Dudley. What, what was the real size of his arms? He was he was trying to say Hulk Hogan size at one point, wasn't he? Well, I, I can't tell you that I ever measured them. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, 14, 16, 23, I have no idea. I couldn't tell you the size of my arm. Can you tell me yours? Uh, I could at one point, but it's a long story. Carry okay. on. <laughs> <laughs> Big Dick, I have no idea what his arms were, but you know, when he came out with that growl and stuff, like people, everybody, but it wasn't like that in real life. He's really a funny guy. I remember being in New York one night and I'm hanging out with uh, Big Dick. We're standing there backstage and Nova comes walking over. I never met Nova before. And he walked there and he goes, Mr. Gordon? I said, yeah. He goes, hi, I'm Nova. I work for you tonight. Well, for some reason, the way it came out, he, Dick and I just started laughing hysterically. It was so odd. I just started to say, hi, nice to meet you. I work for you. And it's like, oh, okay, sorry. I didn't know. Like, And I like, Nova was a great guy too. But that night, I'd never met him before. But every single time, Big Dick saw him at every show. He goes, Nova, who'd you work for tonight? And he busts his chops. Not stop about that incident, but yeah, that's, that's big deck right there. He's another one who had some issues who uh been with Missy Hyde, I think. He went through that locker room pretty good. Uh, anything you want to expand upon, or no, just, just on the side, yeah, okay. Uh, 
I also hear that uh, Big Dick was very, very tough. He was sort of the first person. He always seemed to be perpetually on crutches as well, as when yeah. I think of a ECW. But, uh, he was always, always braced up and kept breaking it and stuff, yeah. How? So that I always thought that was like a, a gimmick thing. So no, he just kept no. breaking his leg. Yeah. Uh-huh. He was hurt for a long time. He had a couple of surgeries on him, I know that. But he was legitimately a tough guy. He's always he's ready to go at any given time. He's like a biker. Like he's ready to jump off the motorcycle and beat the shit out of somebody. <laughs> uh, he's the kind of guy who were, who were attracted to us and we were attracted to. It was like like Hawk would say, we were God bless his soul. All the misfits of wrestling find their way into your locker room. And they all seem to manage to be fine there. Who came up with the Island of Misfit Toys? Who coined the locker room that? I have no idea. I don't know if it was Raven or someone like that, but uh, a couple more. JT Smith. We, we've we not talked about him enough. JT, super, super, super guy. I did one of my earlier shows at a place called Chestnut Cabaret, nightclub, dance club, where it may have been. And we arranged for a show for a Saturday afternoon when um, they were closed. They didn't open, didn't open until nighttime. One of those deals where, you know, we got we got to keep the door and, and, and the merchandise and they kept the, the bar bab. Blah, blah, blah. Like a week before the show, the owner calls me up and goes, hey, that's, the kids were here today trying to get tickets. I said, yeah. He goes, no one's allowed here under 21. What are you talking about? Goes, we don't want anybody in the door who's under 21. I go, if they're under 21, you put a a bracelet on them or whatever, and they'll get served. That's what they do with the Eagles games and everywhere else. And you can't serve on that. Not nobody under 21. I said, dude, I've sold like four or five hundred tickets already. Right? We built a nice show up and then Snooker and we're in uh Koloff and we did a bunch of people on the show. And Snooker appealed to the kids. Nope, wouldn't let me come in. So I had to give all the money back to those people. Ended up with like psh- Maybe 110 people. It should have been like five or six at the end, but maybe like 110 people. I brought all that talent and shows over and I'm paying everybody. Bum, 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 check. Last guy in line is JT Smith. I hear you go, John, and him check. He goes, I can't take that. So what do you mean you can't take that? $75, whatever it was. So I can't take your money. You got killed tonight. I said, everybody else took their money. Said, That's everybody else. I just don't, I can't take it. He ripped the check off. Who is this guy? I go, John, what do you do for a living? Is I'm an usher in a movie theater? Is you an usher in a movie theater? He goes, yeah. And I was just working in a jewelry store. I hired him that day to work for me, Carver I said, never met anybody that honest like that before. And he was such a good guy. So he worked for me at Carver and worked for ECW, which is kind of really interesting. Who else had ever done that? Nobody. And then there was a night when he fell tripped over the rope, smacked his head and had a, a move through and got back to the locker room, even the ringside. It grew, had a swelling like, it was scary swelling. It was so big. And of course, the audience started with, you fucked up. You fucked up. They were just kind people. And uh, <laughs> this guy like, almost died. They're telling me fucked up. You sit there and say, you know what? You got a gimmick here if you can do it right. Because what's that? I go, one time shut match. You got to fuck up the spot. But not make it obvious. Make it, that's, it looks like an accident or it doesn't work at all. And sure enough, he worked on it and worked on it and they started doing it. And every time, the audience, you fucked up. You fucked up. But how long can you go with that? You know, how long can you go with that? You know, they've only had a shelf life. And we keep up with the idea what do we do with JT? What do we do with JT? We're in South Philly. South Philly, all Italians. I mean, all. Oh, I mean, you're lucky to see anyone who's not Italian you'd be amazing. Why don't we say, He's a full-blooded Italian. Italian. Have him come out to sing Sinatra. <laughs> just to piss these people off. And we'll get him heal heat. The last thing they want is a black guy saying he's Italian. Trust me. He came out. They booed him the first couple of times. Next, by the third show, they're all staying along with him. Fly me to the moon. I mean, they, they got over and has a baby face. So then we made the group. We put in a little Guido and Tracy Smothers and a bunch of Tommy Rich. And uh, the real tall guy from New York, his name right now. Big Sal, something like that. He, no, it was another guy. There was, there, was, there was a big Guido. There was a big Guido. Yeah. yeah, yeah, something like that. 
I, I, when I think he's a normal guy. When when I think of JT Smith, uh, sadly, it's that horrendous. Uh, is it the Gladiator? Is it Mike Awesome? And he does the dive, the suicide dive through the ropes, and JT Smith's back just bends straight over the the guardrail. It's just how long did it take for him to recover from that? Would you believe he didn't get hurt? No, I thought he was. Really we thought hurt. he died. The whole locker was like, "Oh my god." Of course, it went to the opening clip. <laughs> it's like anytime I'm like ready to get to like the, the, the chairs, or the, the fight, whatever. It's of course right away in the opening of the show that JD gets bent in half. Nothing. He didn't even get hurt at all. He just sold that right, and, caught, and he just bent the right way somehow. And it was amazing. I would have bet a thousand saying that like he he was out the ring for like a year after that. <laughs> Nothing crazy. Uh, yeah, I remember work the next day before we. <laughs> Jason Knight. Jason's a good guy. Jason is a guy who should have gotten even more than he did because A, he put in a lot of hours. He didn't live here. But he'd drive down from Connecticut or whatever. Just for, you know, to the studio during the week. He bought an idea for you know promo or wanted to do or add in the show. And he'd sit there like an hour, like all night long waiting for Portland to finally get, get in that spot. And he was really good in his role, but Jason also is a really good, talented wrestler. He wasn't really that big, but he was very, very talented in the ring. He really could work his ass off. He threw great kicks. He looked believable, and you know he was probably he wasn't used the right way. To be honest with you, at the beginning he was when he was the, you know, how do you like my suit? Which was a great line to give him because he always used it. And it worked great. We once did a battle royal. Lights out battle royal because electricity went out. <laughs> so, the last, <laughs> the, so the last match of the night, we're going, it's going to be a lights out battle royal because that's the only shot we had. <laughs> so people were lighting their you know, matches or weren't really cell phones yet. <laughs> and everybody's out there brawling, 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 brawling. How do you get out of this? They're going to be brawling in the dark, basically. And you can see them with the, you know, people flash you know, cameras or, and Toward the middle of it, Jason comes to the top stage. He grabs the mic. I don't know how we get the mics working with electricity, but we did. And uh, he goes, "Wait, everybody, stop, stop, stop!" Like twenty-five reps, all stop and look up. And he goes, "I just need to know one thing. How do you like my suit?" <laughs> and I have to go home. Never did the show. And we roll back to the back until we ended it. <laughs> I was. I know this is nothing to do. I was thought he was really good on WWF, but he only did the jobs. Like in ninety three and ninety four and stuff, but he'd always turn up here and there. I will give you two more. I will end it. Rick Rude. Now see, there's you picking the right people. Of all people, I would think he would be the last person I'd ever get close with. And yet he and I became boys, completely became boys. Because he stood off from everybody. He didn't hang out with anybody. Um when he partied, he didn't want to know that he partied. And uh, he and I would always be alone together, you know, often by ourselves partying a lot. I remember being in Florida for a pay per view. He brought his wife and all down, and uh, he and I had my room to hang out, just a little high, a little buzz, smoke some pot, whatever. And uh, Liar Liar came on TV on on their their pay per view, wherever the other boxes were. And it opens up. The very first thing you see on the show is him wrestling Ultimate Warrior, and Jim Carrey's watching on TV. The room was like, is that me? Like, he, he had no idea. You know, just it, 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 see his reaction. It was so interesting. It's like, you know, this guy's a superstar. He's been everywhere. You know, on a top of the card everywhere. And he was so shocked. Like, I was embarrassed to see himself. Like, that was what they used. And uh, he was funny. Like, Rick would smoke like a chimney. And he never bought a pack. <laughs> it was the most amazing for Sawyer. Like, he used to all night going through the dress room. So once we became close, I used to bust his chops and go over to somebody go, get a cigarette. I go, he left his in the machine. He go, quit doing that. He said, like, you're fucking my shit. I quit doing that. He said, yeah, he left his in the machine. Another great Rick's Rude story is Boston. Hacks driving the van. And he must have made a mistake and gotten lost because we, we started out with this giant tower in, in Boston. I don't know what it's called. And driving for 10 minutes, we come back, and there it is again. So Hack goes, Ben, Ben! I'm calling it Big Ben. 
Why? Well, I, I don't know, because he was drunk. Well, once he did it, he realized he had, what he'd done. He did it like three more times. Took the five or ten minute thing around because he thought it was funny. I go, Ben, Ben. Until Rude Leader goes, I'm going to kill this motherfucker. He goes around and says, Big Ben, one more time. Bars closer, 15. I go, okay, he's easy. I go, hey, no more Big Ben. Dude. Seriously, straight up. Back to the hotel. It wasn't funny the second time. Not funny anymore. He goes, all right. We need to go back to the hotel. But I thought Rude's going to kick his ass that night. With, uh, of, like, your name that never can talk about it. Thank you for that. Oh, no, well, I was actually going to even ask him some more. Uh, Storyline wise, I know you're still in the. Uh, you see, I keep saying the ECW and I'm sounding like Bret Hart when I do it because he always used to say the WCW. Uh, why was he brought in with a mask? Because in my mind, I, I think I just invented my own story here. Is Was there some sort of contractual reason why he couldn't show his face on ECW TV, at least at first? Or what do you remember of that? Not at all. Not at all. We. The mask, first of all, every when he came out, you were to know who he was, obviously. But the idea was he was supposed to, I came here to fuck with the franchise. You know, he wanted to, you know, mess with Shane Douglas' head with the storyline. There's never anything about contract at all. He couldn't wrestle, which he was getting paid a lot of money for the insurance for, you know, the insurance thing. He had to hurt. So he would never take a bump, ever. He could have, but he wouldn't. He was smart like that. I mean, he's only guy smart enough to be on WWF and WCW television. Same time on the same night. I mean, he was a unique cat, and uh, yeah, I, I got along really good with Rick. Rick and I were boys. And uh, the last thing about Rick is, how did he end up? I know this is probably just about the time you left, but how did he end up in WWF and ECW at the same time? Was that just purely because Paul was getting paid so much by Vince? <laughs> and why no, not? It was w and WWF at the same time, wasn't it? Uh, ECW and WWF. Yeah, he was he was appearing as like a commentator, wasn't he, for ECW? And then at some point, he yeah. was also doing the DX thing, wasn't he? Yeah, he went. But I don't think they were simultaneous. I think he left back before he did that. I'm not sure. But he, we used him as color commentator and a little bit of manager too, stuff like that. But for the most part, they're just a mess of Shane, bringing Shane down a peg kind of thing. That was the storyline. But I don't know that he worked for both at the same time. He did, I don't remember. I love that line that Rick gives. Uh, Shane says, why are you wearing this mask? And, his, and Rick goes, he, as soon as he speaks, everyone knows it's Rick. And he goes, because if I take this mask off, you're liable to shit your pants right in the middle of this ring. It was like, what a great line, man. <laughs> he was great. Last one. He knew that business, boy. Last one. New Jack. Whew. What did I tell you about New Jack? Um... New Jack and I remained friends to his, to his death. I mean, I was one of the few guys who was there for him when he needed a friend, when he'd get put in jail. And uh, my phone would ring, collect call, like every, like 10 times in a row during dinner when I'm with my family and stuff, and I'd always stop to answer it. Because I don't want to leave a guy who's in jail thinking someone's not taking his call. It's always like, what if he send money? What if he did? What if he... Tell Paul to send money. You know, Jack. Was a handful. He had, a lot of times he caused issues and problems that didn't need to be caused. Sometimes for the attention, sometimes because he was legitimately pissed, and sometimes it's because he was incorrectly pissed because he got something twisted in his head that he thought was being, being done to him. He had a lot of shit done to him, Smokey, whatever, and he was expecting to get screwed. But I didn't screw people, you know what I'm saying? So he and I actually developed a rapport relationship. He got me to use the N-word one time. He's the only person who ever got me to use that. It was done with a humorous intent, actually. But Jack and I were, like I said, we were for many, many years. We stayed friendly up until his death. I could see him on independent shows and stuff. Uh, he was, But he was actually not the person everybody thought he was. I can remember holding him and crying on my shoulder quietly in a room once when his wife had filed for adultery and divorce him, his first wife. We had a sensitive side, too. I mean, it wasn't just... Wow, crazy new Jack. He was a lot of a lot of characters rolled into one, but he felt he had to be badass new Jack, always gonna be on when he was around the boys to keep his spot, so to speak, and keep his image. Mm. On that, I'm gonna thank you so much for your time, all your time as well. And let's give the book one more shove. It's right behind you there. Todd is God. It is out. 
uh, as we speak, uh, not as we record, but while when this is released and sort of like escapes more than release, who knows? Uh, it will be available, and where will it be available, Todd? Uh, Barnes and Noble, Simon and Schuster, Amazon, Rite Aid, and Rite Aid. Uh, how was another place called? Um, it's available anywhere. Amazon's the easiest way to get it. I was, do you know, I was actually going to say about the book that, like, because I've written a couple of books, I did the self-publishing thing, and uh, how come you didn't go that route? How come you ended up going through like a a, a puck of proper publishers and? So now, I mean, it, to me, because you've not self-published it, it's through a proper publisher, it seems like a far bigger deal as well. Well, you know, I discussed that with Sean, who had self-published his own books, or some of them anyway. And he said, let's at least see if, what kind of interest is out there, because believe it or not, I think there's going to be a lot of interest. I said, ah, we were in, the, we're in this audience. It's a, it's a niche audience that wants to, you know, hear about wrestling in ECW. It's not that big. So let's just say, so he put a couple of floaters out there, and I was... See, I, I don't get it sometimes, or I'm humbled by it, but we've got a lot of interest. And it's got a company that's a subsidiary of Simon Schuster, but that's their big publisher. Mm-hmm. Not like, you know, Joe's Publishing, South Philly. But all right, do it. You know, let's see what happens. And I heard from Fumi Saito just today in Japan. I, did, I ordered your book. Japan, I love you got to love that. It's not translated in uh, Japanese, is it? <laughs> No, and I asked him that too. I said, "Did you?" <laughs> yeah, I said the, the, he read English, but I just was wondering about it. Did they translate it to the Japanese audience? It's a big audience for us. They kept us afloat that whole first year buying our dates. And I didn't even know that there were the things tape traders around. There was no internet. We had the internet. Huh? That company would have made some money. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you what. You know, the, the amount of stuff I didn't ask you will blow your mind. But uh, I want to thank you so much for spending so much time with me and. But honestly, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it very, very much. You do a great job. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I agree with you. I think I do pretty all right as well. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, as I say, thank you very much once again, Todd. Uh, Todd is God is available now. Please go buy it. I've read it. It's great. It's more just fun stories. That it is, uh, To explain a bit more about the book, it's not just all like timeline of this match happened, then this ha- match happened, then this match happened, then this thing happened. It's fun stories. It's enjoyable. It's more conversational in nature, and I think that's to its benefits as well. Uh, there you go. So, right, I will say goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. And Todd, say goodbye as well. Thank you, my friend.